Hello humans, dharma bums, and dark night yogis, and welcome to the Cosmic Tortoise podcast. This podcast is with a fellow named Daniel Ingram. Daniel is the author of Mastering the Core Teachings of the Buddha, an unusually hardcore dharma book. He is also an emergency medical doctor. This is, I think, the longest podcast that I've done, and one of the most enjoyable. Daniel is very lucid. He knows a lot about Buddhism and spirituality. He sort of borders on rationality and spirituality, which is a very nice mix. As I say, I think near the end of the podcast, he's no bullshit, which I really appreciated. And we cover a lot in this. If you're interested in Buddhism... If you're interested in high-level meditation, if you're interested in concentration states, psychedelics, general spiritual myth-busting, any of that stuff, this is definitely a podcast for you. So let's dive in. Enjoy. Well, firstly, thanks very much for coming on the podcast. I, I appreciate the time. and Thanks for your interest. And yeah, not a problem. So I discovered you, Daniel, uh, and your work through Slate Star Codex. I suppose you're, you're familiar with the website. Yeah. It's got Alexander's blog. It's a pretty intriguing corner of the internet. And he wrote a pretty interesting and positive re- review of your book, uh, which is, I mean, I, I might as well say the name of the book since people might not know, which is Mastering the Core Teachings of the Buddha, an unusually hardcore Dharma book, <laughs> <laughs> which is such a good such a good title for it. Um, so I thought maybe we could begin with you introducing a little bit more about who you are and your background and the whys and hows that got you into Buddhism. Sure. So I'm a 48-year-old guy who lives in Alabama and currently practices emergency medicine, though I'm getting out of that business. And I um, have spent a reasonable amount of time practicing and studying meditation. I got into all this long ago when Kenneth Folk, who also gets to make these um, circuits sometimes, uh, went on some retreats and I decided to follow uh, his fine example and go on some retreats. And so I went on some retreats and started learning to practice and found that I had some sort of a knack for it and that it really called to me and became really obsessed with it and read a lot and sat a lot and studied a lot and um, eventually ended up writing a book on this stuff and started a community called the Dharma Overground with Vince Horn. And uh, that's the short story. That is the short story. You detail a little bit more about how you got into it in your book initially. You had some kind of experiences when you were younger, right? When you were a teenager. Yeah, so I was um, trying to have better flying dreams, and I have no idea where I got this. I started visualizing these like 50-foot-wide billiard balls in space before I went to sleep and imagined myself flying back and forth between them in order to have better flying dreams, because I've been having flying dreams since I was about five or six, and I love them. And so that visualization practice, or my attempts at visualization practice, somehow got me enough meditative concentration to cross the arising and passing away, which is a classic stage, sort of a point of no return stage. Um, It's a lot of people's first big spiritual moment, and it just happened to be mine. And so that got me um, into philosophy, and eventually that led to to me getting into meditation. So did you kind of stumble across the lucid dreaming sort of thing quite early? 
Yeah, it's just something I just started doing as a pretty young kid. I just had some natural thing. Yeah, nice. Yeah, I've got a couple of friends that have also had uh, sort of, they've, they've always been able to sort of lucid dream from a very young age, and it's led to some very interesting interesting, interesting path in their life, to say the least. Um, yeah, cool stuff. So what you got, what got you interested in the stuff that I'm interested in? What's your interest in this? My interest in this, um, well, I was, I was kind of a materialist atheist, or like agnostic atheist for most of my teen years until I encountered psychedelics. Psychedelics were my entry into this world, essentially. Entry into what I didn't believe was possible, I suppose, with the mind and with the whole spiritual, spirituality thing. So they sort of opened it up, and, and from that point, I... Yeah, I did a bunch of reading and tried my best to separate the woo from the from the real stuff. And yeah, and I'm still on that path. I'm still still checking it all out. Hence why I'm ch- chatting to you right now. It's funny. The longer I do this, the more woo seems to actually not be woo. It seems <laughs> to be actually okay. Wait, maybe. And then some of it actually, yeah. And then some <laughs> of it. Oh my golly, that's amazing. Yeah, perhaps it depends on how deep deep down the rabbit hole you go. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I thought um, maybe to give ourselves a framework to work with for the, the, the rest of the conversation so we can get a bit deeper a bit later on, it might be useful to give a brief overview and definition of, of Buddhism. <laughs> well, like, I don't know, like maybe, maybe just your, maybe just your, um, That's really if, funny. If, you, if you can sum up what Buddhism is for you in, in a couple of sentences, if that's even possible. Yeah, so lots of ways to view Buddhism, and this just happens to be mine. So if you have a different way, cool. Sure. But uh, my this, so I like um, the fact that Buddhism is basically a series of things you can do that hopefully make your mind and life and heart uh, function better and be better and suffer less and be more kind and balanced and hopefully wise and skillful. Um, series of three basic trainings, training in morality, training in um, concentration, and training in insight. So morality would be uh, training to speak well and skillfully and be kind to people and, you know, make a living in a reasonable way and that sort of thing. Training to concentrate would be learning to stabilize attention to attain to specific states called jhanas or dhyanas, depending if you like Pali or Sanskrit. Mm -hmm. And then insight would be training to notice the true nature of sensate reality in a way that makes the sense of a center point or agent or doer or controller or that, that annoying sense of a stable I that's constantly changing it somehow seems to be a real thing to be seen instead as just a bunch of sensations that come and go, which uh, the doing of which in stages creates um, beneficial mental changes you can call awakening or whatever you want to call them. So that would be my very quick summary of the Buddhist um, path and experiment that one can try to replicate for oneself uh, in a few sentences. Sure, sure. So would you say that this idea of enlightenment is that is that a goal of buddhism necessarily or is it uh, just an extra on top of all of that like is is it an end goal or is it a constant constant practice it's really very very difficult to conceive of buddhism without the goal of awakening mm-hmm. i think if you had gone to the buddha and say yeah we're going to have some version of your teachings that doesn't involve the goal of awakening he would find that absurd is my rough guess, given what we seem to know as best we can tell from the writings that we have. It's inconceivable that he would have thought of his path as being anything other than about awakening. Now, yes, there's some other stuff. There's understandings of karma and causality and morality and right speech and right intention and right livelihood and, you know, right action and all those things. But those while clearly highly emphasized by the Buddha and extremely important, largely also serve as a support for then very deep concentration and then awakening. And so the Buddha, when he talks about what he found was suffering and the end of suffering, it's hard to conceive of 
uh, the end of suffering in, as the Buddha understood it and described it without awakening. That's it. Just makes almost no sense whatsoever. It would, so it would be like saying, "Oh, I just bought a car. It just doesn't have any tires or brakes or windshield." Or, <laughs> you'd be like, "Okay, yeah, what kind of a car is that? It's not going to do for you what." cars are typically supposed to do in the same way, I'm pretty sure, as best we can tell from what the Buddha said, awakening was the core aspect of his teaching. And so, you know, when he initially discovered whatever he discovered um, sitting under the Bodhi tree in Bodh Gaya, India, he initially thought, okay, this is so subtle that there's no point in even teaching it because nobody will eat understand this, that clearly was not referring to either just basic morality or even the jhanic states of concentration, which plenty of people in his time were skilled in. So it's talking about something much more subtle, much more profound. And while there are plenty of valid, useful aspects of Buddhism that are being incorporated into all kinds of sort of mick-mindful things, sorry, that was a slightly disparaging term. I don't mean to be <laughs> too cynical, but, um, uh, and, you know, cool, fine, whatever. Uh, that really seems to be sort of like the kindergarten version of what the Buddha was talking about. Yeah, that's uh, I came across that in your book and criticisms of Western Buddhism, and it seems like a lot of the yoga and Buddhism and and these sorts of yeah Western spiritual practices that I've come across don't even go anywhere near even the beginning of what you start in your book. <laughs> it's just very 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 uh, surface level, and uh, so you, so we're using uh, enlightenment and awakening interchangeably here. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. And and again, some people will say they're different things and go into different models and maps. Okay, if that's the way you, some listener does things, fine. But I'm going to use them interchangeably. So you know, the stuff in the book reflects the deep end of the current you know Buddhist practice. In fact, there are plenty of people who would actually look at what I wrote down and said, "Oh, that's that's really still really superficial and light," and the, the super deep end looks like this. No way. So there is. It, so if, I'm not definitely not defining one end of the spectrum by any means. There's yeah. a whole level of the spectrum out there that, that, from my point of view, some of which looks a little bit idealized, some a little bit mythologized. Okay, fine, whatever. But there is this whole range out, even in terms of harder and stricter and uh, more severe criteria for what basic practice and progress would be, even than the stuff I do. So I actually think of myself as defining some sort of middle ground or perhaps middle way, wow, if okay. you will. Right. Interesting. So uh, we've got here, you've already just gone over the fundamentals in the book, and I thought maybe we could get into those just a little bit more. So first, so you've got mor morality training. Uh, I thought, you know, if we could dive a little bit more into exactly what that is, uh, what sort of practicing with morality is, and, and why it's limitless. Sure. So it, if you take morality as defining anything you could usefully learn to do that is skillful and helpful, that is not meditation— Mm -hmm. So everything other than learning to concentrate your mind or learning to see the true nature of sensate phenomena, everything else to me, and as far as I can tell to the Buddhas well, when I read the old Pali canon stuff and the commentaries, uh, everything other than meditation falls under the training in morality or you know, living a skillful life in the ordinary sense, the ordinary sense that basically everybody can relate to, the way you speak, the way you act, the way you um you know, whether or not you are a good person or a bad person, sort of put it generally, or an ethical person or an unethical person. Um, you know, someone who, um, you know, avoids breaking the five precepts, for example, of, you know, not killing, not stealing, not lying, etc. Mm -hmm. um, not using substances that lead to heedlessness, not, you know, committing uh, sexual violations of people. Yeah, You know, the question is, so all of those things are extremely important. And the thing about that is, if you think about all the skillful, useful things you could learn to do in the world, it's it's pretty inconceivable that you could come to the end of that knowledge, right? Yeah. The knowledge of how to speak well, of how to write well, of how to make a living well, of how to practice whatever craft or useful thing you hopefully do in the world that's helping people. It's, you know, how can you find the end of those things. I, I, there's no obvious endpoint. There's no obvious way to define an endpoint. Uh, 
and consequently, I think of that as the training that is the hardest of them all because it's vast and encompasses everything that isn't meditation, which is nearly everything, mm-hmm. and yeah. everything you could possibly learn to do well. And, you know, psychology and philosophy and all of that. Um, so how we relate to our emotions and how we relate to other people, all, you know, from an ordinary point of view, those are gigantic things that we're still working on working out the you know the best way is to do lots of things still working on technology still working on uh, still debating questions of ethics still figuring out how to do lots of good stuff so um, that is is something that even if you became extremely skilled in concentration or extremely skilled in insight practices i would say that you're still going to be working on training and morality because there is no obvious endpoint, and that's what people find themselves doing even after they wake up or they become very, very skilled at attaining deep concentration states. You still have to figure out how to relate to people wisely. And I know plenty of people who have learned to concentrate well and even uh, woken up to small or large degrees who still, like myself, have plenty to work on when it comes to you know, ordinary things in life. Um, sure, you can sure. still work on being kinder and more reasonable and all that kind of stuff. Is this perhaps where some of these yogis might fall off the boat a little bit when they've reached these other states to such a higher degree that they 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 perhaps have convinced themselves that they've that they don't need any more morality training? I mean, we've all heard some of the casualty stories from from some of these interesting yogis up in the mountains. Hundred, yeah. Hundreds. I mean, not yeah. just up in the mountains, but in the cities and the meditation centers across the world and across the centuries, right? So there's, you go back to the time of the Buddha, there were still plenty of people screwing up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, there's nothing new about this. So yeah, at 2,500 years, we have good records of people screwing up in the spiritual path and becoming <laughs> fascinated with their attainments and, and uh, assuming that they were beyond morality or had already figured everything out and were perfectly skillful at you know relating to their minions or whatever it is yeah. <laughs> um, good luck with that so I would again advocate for anyone who's on this path whatever it is you attain on the cushion uh, still assume that there is a vast amount to learn about being skillful off the cushion good. that's my general piece of advice I apply it to myself as best I can and I would advocate that other people apply it to themselves as best they can very, very good to know. <laughs> All right. So Nick. yeah, real world. We've gotten. I've gotten to do plenty of real world testing. I mean, the the interesting thing about handing, you know, sort of hanging out a shingle like mastering the core teachings of the Buddha, or calling yourself various names, um, you know, labeling attainments, is that for better or for worse, you get to meet lots of interesting people. A reasonable number of which have, you know, cl- reasonable claims to attainments and and demonstrable evidence of real attainments and thought by plenty of reasonable people to have real attainments. And I don't, there are plenty of really nice people in the bunch, but I don't know any of them that I would consider perfected in morality. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and not that I would, I would even know how to define perfection. Not that I haven't met a lot of extremely kind, thoughtful, moral, saintly people I have, but still, um, you, you hang out with anybody long enough, you'll see the little quirks and <laughs> um, things that might reasonably be considered subtle flaws that might benefit from some maturation. And that obviously applies to me totally as well. I'm not um, saying anything holier than thou. I'm definitely yeah. in the bunch of still trying to figure those kinds of things out as best I can. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. So next up, we've got concentration training what you describe as focusing on an object such as the breath to attain unusual and profound altered states of concentration. So what do you mean here by, I'm going to keep it kind of basic at the beginning, but we'll dive in later. So for now, what do you mean by altered states and are these accessible by anyone? So they should be accessible by anyone who has a, you know, basically functioning brain. Um, And they would be called jhanas. And so And there are different degrees to which one can get into this. There are endless debates about where you draw the line and say this is suddenly jhana and this is not jhana of how deep the rapture or the bliss or the stability of attention or the silence of mind or the equanimity or how long it lasts or whatever. There's plenty of debates on the criteria. You can, you know, see on one end of the range you have like sort of ayakema and the other end of the range you have people like B. Allen Wallace and... Um, Achan Brahm and some of these people who define 
these things. Then, and then you've got this whole middle range. And I would say that the world of genre is vast and wide and not sort of like all of a sudden at this point, this highly altered state becomes genre. I think it's this vast range of things from relatively light genres, we would call it, you know, where you've got a, a moderate amount of stable attention. You've got some genic factors, which would be like bliss or rapture in your body. Your mind is relatively quiet. It's staying on an object nicely. But you can still do things like, say, feel your body or still notice a thought arise, you know, mm-hmm. however subtle or quiet, as opposed to then the far end of the range of people who, you know, say, oh, only this is genre. We're talking about, you know, minimum four hours or 24 hours or however long people say these things last and body totally gone and entirety of space filled with white light. And, mm-hmm. you know, so there, there's these ranges of where people say the thing begins. But to me, it's this sort of vast, complicated territory that can be described in shades of gray um, with descriptions of how strongly one has gotten into these traditionally described stable or relatively stable states of um, consciousness that are profound, transient, temporary, extremely restful. They take a lot of positive mental qualities to get into. You have to have cultivated your attention and your mind to get into these things. Once you get into them, they themselves encourage the cultivation of mind because the the jonic factors of bliss or rapture or equanimity or subtle bliss or peace or whatever get, or, you know, formlessness gets stronger as attention gets stronger. So Mm -hmm. they naturally sort of give you a really cool positive feedback mechanism for figuring out how to get your concentration more stable and natural and well-developed. Yep. And so, and these things are definitely accessible by plenty of people today. So, and lots of cool objects you can use for that, lots of cool tricks and techniques, but plenty of people get into these things these days. Nice. Yeah, we'll get a bit more into that in, uh, later in the conversation, perhaps, but that's a nice summary of it. Um, so, the third one that we have here is wisdom uh, inside or understanding. And uh, yeah, so we've got the three characteristics of ultimate reality, which are impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, and no self. So before we dive into that, what do you mean exactly by ultimate reality? Okay, so ultimate is it's kind of a loaded term that a lot of people then suddenly take issue with. Now you can say that's <laughs> ultimate and gets into questions of ontology. But each training has its own sort of conceptual or philosophical framework that it adopts as being useful or pragmatic when thinking about that training. Mm-hmm. So, for example, when thinking about training in morality, we think, okay, I am a person who can choose to speak or act or think in various ways, and those consequences will happen to me, and this is my karma and my choice, and and I assume that I'm kind of a free agent in the world that can do unskillful or skillful things and reap the consequences of those actions. So it's assuming a self, it's assuming uh, free will, it's assuming some degree of integration into the world, but there's also some sense of separateness that I am making my choices and all of those kinds of things. Mm-hmm. So that would be training the assumptions of training morality, regardless of whether or not those things are true. Physics, you know, would say, oh, those things are not true. We're just, you know, just transient psi square fields just manifesting according to natural laws. Mm-hmm. It, would, it would think those assumptions were ridiculous. But then, you know, plenty of people who, you know, but that's sort of a framework that may not apply really in that sort of macro situation as usefully as maybe assuming that you have choice. So on, in contrast to that, training and insight has a totally different set of assumptions that it has found to be useful, regardless of whether one consul- considers them ultimately true. And one of those sets of assumptions is that uh, we don't exist as a stable, continuous entity, that um, there are just these manifesting sensations that arise and vanish based on conditions, and that none of them are a stable sense of a doer, controller, or a self, and and actually starts looking a lot like physics, where it says these are all just things happening naturally according to the laws of the universe, whatever those might be, and um, that in looking at reality through that lens or that set of useful frameworks or paradigms, we see that, oh, in fact, sensations are transient. Our thoughts are transient. Our bodily sensations are transient. Wait, where is the sense of self that we think is always there? And we notice in our six sense doors, wait, there is a thought, but it's gone. There is a bodily sensation, but it's gone. Wait, I try to control my thoughts and I can't really do that. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, mm-hmm. people have noticed this, like one of the first people thing most people notice when they sit on the cushion is that their mind is kind of all over the place, right? It seems to be doing its own thing in the Mm. sense that, oh, wow, I'm in control of my body and mind. Yeah, good luck with that. 
Good yeah. luck with that. Yeah. Um, and so we, we start to notice, okay, wait a second, maybe this Buddha guy was not so crazy. And we start to notice, wait, my mind is restless and sometimes irritating and bodily sensations are irritating. And there's a sort of weird drive to get somewhere, to get something, to get away from things, to kind of tune out from things, to get towards pleasant sensations, to get away from unpleasant sensations. And there seems to be this weird thing in the middle of our head that's constantly trying to either get to the side where pleasant things are or get away from the side where unpleasant things are or just kind of tune out from the whole thing entirely as if somehow this will help. And so, you know, greed, hatred, and delusion, if you want to call it that, or, you know, ignorance or, you know, whatever, dualistic misperception, pick your favorite term for this strange dance that we do. And so in insight training, we make things very, very simple that the goal is is not necessarily to be a good or a bad person or whatever. The goal is to, or to, you know, necessarily train in, in strict, stable concentration states. The goal of training in wisdom, as I would see it, is framed in traditional Theravadani kind of ways of looking at it, is once one has developed, you know, some facility with directing one's mind, one directs that to notice that here are six sense doors, you know, seeing, um, hearing, feeling, thinking, smelling, tasting. Each of the sensations arise and vanish very rapidly on their own, and there's this weird dualistic tension in it that's irritating, that's causing the mind to move towards and away from things, and there's something really painful in that. Mm. So, weirdly enough, the simplest of the set of assumptions of all of the trainings is insight. People usually think it's, oh, it's so complicated, it's so weird. No, it's really straightforward. You sit down, here's your sense doors, here's your sensations, you notice these aspects of them. That's it. And when, when I say universal or ultimate, it's because you will notice that every single sensation arises and vanishes. You can't find a stable sensation. Mm. There is none at mm -hmm. a sensate level. So that seems, to, when I say ultimate, I mean it, it's universal. It's a universal characteristic. It applies to all sensations. We can find no stable sensation. Nobody's ever found a stable sensation, right? They, they come and go. They change and vanish. There's, none of them continue. Um, and so I will... So that's the first universal characteristic. The second universal characteristic is that, oh, actually, these things do arise causally. And the more you notice clearly and the more you get good at clearly noticing exactly what's happening in your sensate reality, the more people go start to go, okay, wait a second. I really don't seem to be in control the way I thought it was. Even the intentions to do things that are, arise before actions seem to arise in this weird causal way like everything else. Mm -hmm. So they get good at noticing that. And then this weird tension, like you can start to notice, wait, this weird tension is in everything, even pleasant sensations. The mind's doing this weird dance of trying to get closer to pleasant sensations, which doesn't seem to make any sense because I can't even find the thing that's trying to do this. And yet somehow it seems that I'm this thing that is changing and constantly being recreated out of more transient sensations and moving around. And sometimes <laughs> it's the back of my head and sometimes it's my eyes and sometimes it's the front of my head and sometimes it's kind of in my chest or in my throat. What is this thing? But I'm always kind of looking at this thing that I think is me anyway. And so what, what sense does that make? It's incredibly confusing. And yeah. in fact, it's confusing because it's totally crazy. I mean, it's a strong word to use, but it's purely delusional. There is no such thing that you can find an experience, but we sure do our best to try to make little transient sensations into an us somehow. Yeah, it's a, yeah. and, uh, and, and while the mind is doing that, it's a, it turns out it's a really painful thing to do. And it, life gets a whole lot better the less we do that. And so you can learn to see sensations just as sensations rather than some, you know, attempting to make them a stable self. And through insight practices, we can get better and better at noticing that, okay, wait a second, don't have to do that can see things clearly and seeing things clearly makes the process um, less sticky. Yeah, sure. So, so through some sort of uh, mechanism of, our, of the chaos that we are, we have this sort of craving, right? We have this craving to be away from suffering or towards pleasant sensations, as you say. And uh, I've, I mean, I've read this in plenty of places, but that seems to be one of the core teachings of Buddhism, right? Is that craving yeah. is suffering or craving causes well, suffering. Um, it's ignorance that causes the whole weird dance. So it's right. because we think that somehow that there's this stable thing that we can never find and constantly seem to be looking at, and then it's gone and then seems to be us, but it's not us. I mean, if you ever <laughs> try to chase down in your experience really fast, okay, exactly where am I? Yeah. <laughs> it's a fascinating thing to try to do, and it's a good insight kind of exercise to do. And, and it turns out that the 
the process of misperception, of sensate misperception, that allows some, station, some sensations, excuse me, to not be perceived clearly enough to be recognized as just being more causal stuff happening that isn't observing or controlling or doing anything. It's all just sensations arising and vanishing. Because we misperceive sensations, there is this weird dance that gets set up. And the more clearly sensations are perceived, all of them, all the little sensations that seem to be making up sense, our sense of self, you know, this process, and all of the sensations that seem to be other, the better we perceive all of those, the more there's a chance to recognize, okay, wait, no, truly, now I see clearly, none of this is self. It's just a bunch of sensations happening. Mm -hmm. And again, this way of looking at the world is useful when doing insight practice is not so useful when doing anything else. <laughs> so we, each, each of these trainings has its, has its place and its frameworks that make sense in a specific context and may not make great sense in other contexts. Sure, sure. So this kind of brings us to this idea of no self, right? And uh, a lot of people, and this was me until recently, actually, had the idea that Buddhism cultivates detachment. And I've come across this just chatting with people that know a little bit about Buddhism or they know somebody that's a Buddhist and they've talked about this sort of idea of no self. And it seems to be this common idea that people think that yeah, this no self thing is this sort of psychotic state where there's no motivation to do anything and there's no emotions and you're completely detached and this is why monks live in the mountains by themselves and do and do nothing all the time. And I th so I thought, I thought you might like to do a bit of myth busting here and uh, and maybe maybe define equanimity a little bit for some people. Yeah, so that's a great point. And uh, yeah, thank you. It's a, it's a good opportunity to have some fun. So, <laughs> sure. And there, the first thing is there are plenty of texts that you can find that reinforce those views. So it's not like these people are coming out of nowhere and just making up crazy. There's actually plenty of crazy in the old text. So, oh, okay. so we, if, you, if you read the old text or the old ide ideals or, you know, about the monk who's walking across the battlefield and feeling nothing or about you know, plenty of the ways that some of these things get described in some of the texts that are not quite as useful or some of the myths and legends that are not quite as pragmatically useful, um, you can get these kinds of impressions. So it's it's not like they're just coming out of nowhere and they're reinforced by plenty of pop culture and cartoons and Zen legends and Tibetan myths. I mean, so they're all branches of Buddhism contribute to this. And then pop culture contributes to this and Hinduism does as well. And so, you know, whatever Hinduism is, it's this vast, complicated set of, you know, traditions you find sort of across India and Nepal and the region and other places. Um, so, uh, all of these things contribute to some of those ways of thinking, okay, wait, no, enlightenment is this horrible, strange thing that I couldn't possibly do and doesn't seem appealing. Or if it does, it's very weird and, you know, no normal people could be functioning in that kind of a state. It turns out that's not true. So there are plenty of awakened people who are leading lives that would seem incredibly ordinary. Because and, and so I want to address the, the concept of detachment, because detachment is this really dangerous thing. Right, So mm. the vast majority of the time, detachment is sort of a version in disguise where you just want to push away the world. And you find that different people, you can actually tell a lot about the person by the specific advertising strategies for enlightenment that they're attracted to. Mm -hmm. So uh, there are aversive types and there are desirous types and there are sort of ignorant types. <laughs> this, is, yeah. this is a classic Theravadan way of classifying people. <laughs> okay. Um, and so I'm an aversive type, just in case anybody's wondering. My my tendency is to kind of push stuff away. I had to work really hard not to have that become a shadow side, right? Which it easily can be. So I, I'm that's the one I'm the most familiar with because it's it's the one that I'm the most tempted by, sort of as my personality style. So um, detachment, where you say, "Oh, that's not me. That's not me. These thoughts are not me. These emotions are not me." And uh, okay skillful if done well, if it's just clear recognition, but if it's actually sort of a psychological handout that kind of pushes these things away, that then actually becomes aversion, mm. right? That actually becomes ignorance, that becomes ignoring, that becomes, uh, you know, the unskillful sort of dissociative uh, depersonalization, derealization end of, uh, you know, or sort of skill 
schizoid just kind of push the world away, push friends away, push people away, push everything away, you know, can become uh, sort of pathological. And so one has to be very, very careful with any of the teachings of meditation, right? Because they, any of them have their shadow sides and that's the shadow side of that one. And, and it's not like the Buddha didn't talk about detachment. Mm -hmm. clearly. It's all over the text, right? Sure. So it's, it's not coming out of nowhere, but there's a way to do it that's really skillful that just recognizes each of the sensations arising. Clearly, just straightforwardly, this is arising over there. There's just arising there, arising there, arising there. But you have to see it for all the sensations, even the, most, the ones that feel the most intimate. And um, not in some aversive way, but just some clear recognition. Oh, there is a sensation arising and vanishing. It just arose and vanished. It was just right there, and that's all it was. Simple. So there's a, a good way to do the, sort of the teachings of detachment, and there's a really bad way to do the teachings of detachment. And so just one has to be really careful if one's going to go into uh, this with a framework like that. Um, and then you have like the desirous types. So the desirous types are like, ooh, when I get enlightened, I'm going to be loving and blissful. And I will just be, you know, it'll be perfect bliss and perfect harmony and perfect oneness and perfect love, right? And mm -hmm. so all of those then become ideals, right? And then, so those can be equally sort of complicated traps when they may not accept anything that isn't perfectly nice and wonderful and loving and blissful as being spiritual, right? So that mm -hmm. can suddenly like create this gigantic shadow side around the dark sides of life or pain or, or you know, relationships that might have some difficulties or whatever, you know, and they can reject those as not being spiritual or highest or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and then you have ignorant people People. So it's sort of a, it sounds harsh and judgmental, but this is just the way the ancient commentaries and, and traditions do this. So mm -hmm. you would have ignorant people who who their tendency is just kind of tune the whole thing out, and they can just kind of sit there, you know, um, in the state of what would seem like detachment, but is really a, aversion in disguise, and is really indifference masquerading as equanimity. So the near enemy. Um, meaning the thing that's like it, but kind of deadening spiritual, post, you know, sort of imposter of equanimity. So the imposter of equanimity is indifference. And indifference is actually deadening and heart deadening and mind deadening and the antithesis of where it's all trying to go. But it can really feel when one gets sufficiently indifferent, if one really cultivates that, that one is really doing something profoundly spiritual and really becoming the detached Buddhist ideal, whatever, when in fact one is just learning to ignore the vast majority of one's heart, mind, and body. And so, you know, there are plenty of people who practice ignoring their emotions or ignoring their thoughts or ignoring life's difficulties or ignoring, you know, suffering beings or ignoring whatever it is. That actually is really you know, dangerous, mm -hmm. um, de sort of dehumanizing spiritual practice. But but these ideals, you can find representations that can lead people to these sorts of ideals in the text. You just have to be really careful with those. When in equanimity itself, as you were, I think, alluding to and hoping I would say, it got sense from your, your leading question, so thank you for that. <laughs> um, uh, equanimity itself is very full field. It's very full spectrum. It's very uh, wide and broad and inclusive and bright and amazing. Real equanimity is this incredible flowing, moving, shifting, open thing. Um, and so, yeah, one has to be careful with the spiritual myths because there are so many myths out there and most of them have hints of truth in them, but then can become these incredibly problematic things. Okay. That sums it up. Nice. Sorry, that was, that was a long... No, answer, that's exactly that's exactly exactly what I uh, what I was after. Thank you, thanks for that. Um, you talked in there a little bit about thoughts, so I thought we could move into uh, sort of the nature of thought and the idea of thought as I. Uh, I've I've chatted with friends about this, and there was a, a quite a while back when uh, I don't know if this is a common idea. It seems to be a common idea that people believe that they are they are their thoughts and if they're having negative thoughts or weird fucked up thoughts or strange thought whatever thoughts that they're having if they're having negative thoughts or weird thoughts or fucked up thoughts then they are a negative bad or fucked up person uh <laughs> I, you know what i mean but like i, I know a lot of oh, sure. I, i've I, come I, across yeah. plenty of people that, that that believe us and uh, I I think I actually believed it until I came across uh, some sort of Buddhist teaching about it was uh, it made an analogy between a flowing river and and the mind and that thoughts are just flowing past in the river and you just pick what ones you want to use 
and the rest of them you can kind of if, if they're fucked up and weird you can kind of just laugh them off so I'm, I'm curious what your take is on the nature of thought and the idea of thought as i yeah so it's a great point um so the, the first thing is thoughts are sensations right and we can learn to notice thoughts at a sensate level and we can notice that thoughts actually are made up of the other five sense doors so there are actually no unique um, experiential aspects of thought. There are different ways that thoughts function to some of the other sense doors, but there aren't any different experiential, ex sorry, experiential things um, about thought. So thoughts are either have some visual components or some auditory components or some tactile components or even olfactory or gustatory components. And so you could actually, if one wanted to get more interesting about this, say there are only five sense doors, out of which some of the qualities that manifest in these five sense doors we label as thought because of some certain things about their subtlety as and insubstantiality and the way that they seem to function and not have the same sort of material limitations of some of the other tactile or auditory or visual things. They seem to sort of go by their own rules. Hmm. And we single these experiences out and say, oh, these sensations are thought. Right. And a lot of people don't even recognize that that's what they're doing. Thoughts just seem to be thoughts, and they don't even know how they experience them, even though they do experience them, because they can recognize, oh, I'm thinking these bad thoughts or these crazy thoughts or these, you know, unspiritual thoughts or whatever. Um, I would say that for the vast majority of people, the vast majority of their thoughts are probably not that useful. Mm. They're just, because the mind just sort of chatters along. It's kind of what it does. And a lot of that is just old loops and weird you know, patterns that most of which we've gone down many times before, repeated memes from media or conversations or things we learned to repeat in our childhood or whatever. And these things just sort of play in a sort of hit of the day or, you know, sort of tape loop style fashion where we have these various loops that kind of run a lot. And the vast majority of that is pretty useless. And I would say that applies to my thoughts as well as the vast majority of people's thoughts. And people are like, oh no, my thoughts are all wonderful and smart and, <laughs> yeah. and clear and all these things. Yeah, actually sit down on a cushion for half an hour and just pay attention to the content of your thoughts and see what percentage of what your mind comes up with is actually really true and useful. I'll bet it's actually a relatively small percentage. Not that we don't think useful things, we do, but it's not a lot of what happens in thought. And if we judged ourselves based on the content, sorry, the content or the quality of our thoughts and say, well, that's the defining aspect of who I am, that would be a quick trip to depression for most <laughs> <Yeah>. people. <laughs> yeah. Because I'd say most most people, when they one of the first things they discover in meditation is that their mind is not that helpful. And a lot of it is pretty unskillful and psychologically not particularly mature. And this applies to me as well. So I'm not, again, saying anything holier than thou stuff. This is what something we've all observed when we started meditating. We sit down and we go, ooh, <laughs> uh, whoa. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's, and that's why a lot of people stop meditating, right? Because they sit down on the cushion, their mind starts, they start noticing what their mind does. And they're like, oh my God, <laughs> I need to go back to distracting myself with work or entertainment or drugs or whatever it is. You know, it's, yeah. that's no way. I'm, no way. I can't handle that. And yeah. what's weird, what's freakish though? Okay. Here's the funny thing though. If you actually just sort of like open up your attention to the room you're sitting in or the space you're sitting in or the field you're sitting in or wherever you're sitting or the car or whatever it is, and notice how strong the sensations of thought are in terms of actual their sort of volume and intensity in comparison to all the visual, auditory, and tactile sensations around you and taste if you're eating a meal or whatever. You'll notice that it's incredibly subtle Thought this is an experience. This is an incredibly subtle thing, right? Which is why it's slippery. It's tricky, right? The vast majority of our sensate world, like if you were going to sort of put a volumometer, like or, or a, you know, like if you do video stuff, like you have these meters that you know show the intensity of you know how maxed out the pixels are in terms of color saturation or whatever, or if you have a decibel meter and you put it on thought and you try to see how loud thought is in comparison to most of the you know, auditory or visual world around you, you'd find thought as this incredibly subtle part of this vast, rich experience of the room we're sitting in or the car or the field or the back porch or wherever it is, right? And yet somehow it's so tyrannical. It seems so important. Mm -hmm. It seems like so powerful. And yet 
if you actually start doing insight practices and start noticing things at a sensate level, you notice thoughts are really incredibly small, subtle portion of the field, less than a tenth of a percent if you were going to do the volume, you know, sort of the volume of the field and how loud thoughts are in comparison to all the other visual and auditory and tactile sensations. Like, and seriously, this is the little like teeny mouse that's that's making this giant elephant of us like freak out, really? Mm -hmm. yeah. Like, how embarrassing is that? <laughs> okay, that's kind of embarrassing, right? Yeah. I'd be embarrassed, you know, we're all embarrassed when we notice, okay, wait a second, I've been running from these thoughts and let these little, these subtle thoughts that are just a little teeny part of this field, most of which are useless, define me or rule me or, you know, really um, make me all afraid or all crazy or whatever. Yeah. Really? I've yeah. been doing that most of my life. That's kind of horrible. But luckily it's relatively easy to see, okay, wait a second. I, I don't have to relate to thoughts that way. I can notice what's useful about thoughts and their useful messages that they can sometimes co convey for certain types of tasks and they can be helpful. And then the rest of it I can just notice is just little sensations in a big old wide open field of experience and I don't have to have them be some big deal that causes me a lot of trouble. Um, yeah. I can work with them from that point of view, which is a much nicer point of view than being caught in them or identifying with them. I mean, to say that I am my thoughts, right? I mean, how transient and subtle are thought, yeah. right? Somehow you're identifying with this incredible, incredibly transient, subtle thing. Those are really you. Well, then who's observing the thoughts? Who's judging the thoughts? Is that the thoughts or is that you? Or wait a second, suddenly the thoughts are something you're noticing from a distance and going, those thoughts there are me? Okay, wait, but where's the me that's then looking at those thoughts? Yeah. I mean, you see the whole pride, it's totally crazy, right? But that's that's what we have to work with until we really get good at insight practices. Yeah, it's it seems like something that terrifies a lot of people. And this is quite, it seems quite obvious when you talk to people about float tanks, because I've... I've I've done a bit of floating and a few of my friends have and have you have you spent any time in any float tanks? I've got one one hour and one two hour float. So I've floated twice and really enjoyed it. I found it fascinating actually. Yeah. It's, um, it's weirdly really... enough, the first one was all about neck popping. So my like my first float, I thought I was gonna be, oh, I've got all these jonic chops, I'm gonna get in, uh, into all these <laughs> interesting states and stuff. No. My neck spent the entire hour doing weird popping cracking things <laughs> and sort of weirdly like adjusting itself in some way that seemed to have nothing to do with me at all. It must have cracked and popped and done these strange decompressing popping things thousands of times during that hour. It was every few seconds it was doing some weird cr cracking popping thing. And that was the whole <laughs> first float. <laughs> like, I was like, really? Maybe it's all the, mag obvious. Maybe it's all the magnesium and the Epsom salts. Something it had, it had something it needed to work out. My neck felt felt much better after it, but during it, it was quite annoying. So I mean, like the people report all these different experiences. But anyway, so go ahead. Yeah. So a thing that I've found with float tanks is people seem to be very much. There's not really any middle ground with people's emotions about the idea of floating, right? So you you talk to somebody about floating, explain what it is. If they're not familiar with it, there's usually one or two reactions you get. Uh, Wow, that sounds amazing. Where do I? Where can I do this? Uh, and the second reaction is, "Fuck that! That sounds horrible. That sounds like the worst thing, my worst nightmare. I, how could I be by myself for two hours in the dark?" Yeah, plenty of people. Just the notion of not being distracted by something is terrifying to them, and it's you know. But then when you sit down and notice, wait, it's thoughts mostly, right? And feelings, which are some complicated interaction of thought and physical sensation that. Yeah they just can't stand to actually be with, that's telling and sad and changeable. So it's not like that's a fixed state. You can learn to be okay with just noticing thoughts come and go, noticing feelings doing their thing, not in a way that's either aversive or desirous, you know, sort of fundamentally, but actually just going, oh, wow, those are feelings. Those are patterns. Those are psychological things. And they're just part of what's going on in this room and embrace them, but also hold them in their reasonable proportion in terms of what percentage of their experience that, you know, mm. uh, what percentage of your experience they make up and how important or not important they should be in yeah. terms of uh, function. Yeah. 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 So I would agree. Yeah. When I talk about, uh, you know, I talk to people about my my two little floats. Um, yeah, I get about 50-50 reactions, just like you were saying. That's yeah. my experience as well. Yeah, it's really interesting. Eh? 
Um, well, how about the body as I? Because you kind of get a sense of weightlessness in a float tank, but I recently had an experience with a type of anesthetic in which I lost sense of my body, basically my whole body. And I found that quite kind of uncomfortable and destabilizing. And it made me ketamine? realize... Yeah, it was kidding me. <laughs> and it made me realize that I, that I identify quite a bit with the sense of having or being a body. Like this, just, it's a nice feeling, this, this sense of having a body. But I'm wondering, you know, is it a useful thing to be comfortable with a loss of body awareness? Is this something that, you, that you'd, uh, you've encountered or that you train in, in, in these states? Well, so I presume everybody sleeps, right? Yeah. yeah. And when we sleep, you know, our so. bodies disappear, <laughs> Right, and so we all have experiences of our body kind of disappearing and then reappearing, mm -hmm. just like thought, you know. And that somehow we're okay. So everybody's ex experienced this. Anybody who's had surgery or you know some kind of surgical procedure, who's had general anesthesia, has, you know, had their body disappear, and then all of a sudden they wake up and they're back, and there's their body, and the body changes. So the notion that somehow the body would be us. Um, our bodies are changing all the time, but more than that, our sensations of the body are changing all the time. So like when people are thinking a thought, like in the shower, you can take a whole shower and not have even noticed if you even scrubbed yourself, mm -hmm. right? You can drive to work and not even remember anything about the drive. And yet it was this incredibly complicated series of interactions that somehow happened. You, I, When I type, if I'm, so I, I happen to be a pretty fast typer only because um, modern Western medicine involves an unbelievable amount of computer time and documentation. And I found that if I'm paying attention to my fingers, I can type at about half the speed as if I pay no attention to them at all and mm -hmm. just let them type while I'm thinking. And so there are all kinds of curious things where we can function fine without even really noticing our bodies. Not that I actually don't advocate for noticing our bodies, um, in plenty of circumstances, particularly when doing insight practices, because the more you notice, wait, the sensations of the back of my head are not the observer. They're not the controller. They're just sensations of hairs and skin and stuff. The sensations of my nose are not the controller or the doer. They're not a stable eye. And as you notice that attention moves around on the body, so like notice your toe and then notice your ear. Can you notice your ear and your toe at the exact same time? Well, it turns out, no, it kind of seems like you can until you really notice the fine grain resolution of the kind of oscillation of attention back and forth you have to you know, do to notice a toe and an ear at the same time. And so uh, it turns out we can't perceive our whole body simultaneously. We, we sample it we, and we construct the sense of a stable body image out of all these little sensations, visual sensations and, and sort of spatial locationing, you know, proprioceptive sensations and, and the tactile sensations of the contact of, contact of our skin with things or, you know, the air in our lungs or in sense of internal muscles or, you know, all the nerves that that innervate our body, but it's this complicated patchwork, like sort of like 3D TV snow that's creating this mm -hmm. sense of a body, but it's nothing resembling stable. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It's nothing stable at all. And so if you notice at a pure sensate level, taking actual sensations is the gold standard for reality when doing insight practices. And when talking about, you know, the, the sense of no self and at that level, you actually can't find any stable bodily sensations either. There's a lot of sensations. They recur in certain patterns, but recurrence is not quite the same as stability, right? Oh, there's the top of my head. Oh, there's my toe. Oh, there's the top of my head again. And it feels basically the same, but that's a new fresh crop of sensations arising and vanishing. Those are not the same sensations that disappeared and have now reappeared. They're new sensations mm -hmm. that just happen to be of the same general quality. Oh, yeah. And so by noticing that really carefully, we can notice, okay, no way, the body is obviously important, right? Yeah. You know, uh, but uh, it's not us in the sense of a stable, coherent, continuous thing. It's actually this patchwork of sensate impressions. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So what about uh, this, this idea in meditation of emptying thought? Because as a musician, I often find that there's, there's songs constantly playing in my head. Like there'll be different types of music or different ideas of music. There won't necessarily be thoughts, but I suppose they'd be considered Those a, a are thought. thoughts. Those are thoughts of the Those same. Those are thoughts. Yeah. Absolutely. Remember, yeah. they're auditory, visual, tactile, gustatory, yeah. factory thoughts, right? So they've yeah. got these qualities. And yeah, I'm, I'm a musician too, so I often have... Uh, songs going in my head as well. Yeah. And what do you do musically? 
I'm a singer, I, I write, I play a few different instruments, produce. Yeah. Fun. Yeah, it's good nice. fun. You play the bass, right? Yeah, I play some bass and guitar, and I do some electronica and other nice. digital things. Cool. Yeah. So people can check out my strange little SoundCloud channel. It's, it's uh, um, anyway, you can hear my little mu- attempts at uh, creating music. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Well, you've got everything on your on your integrated Daniel website, right? You've got uh, yeah a lot of stuff about Buddhism, and there's music, and there's all sorts of all sorts of other things. And you're building a some kind of a house, or you built some sort of a house, and out of yeah, I built a straw bale house. Uh, straw, so bales of straw for the walls and timber framed uh, structure and lime clay plaster walls and cool, yeah, pretty ultra ultra green. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I couldn't really I don't recommend it to anybody unless you have super deep pockets. But anyway, oh sorry, we we're talking. Yeah, <laughs> no and, pa- and a lot of patience, <laughs> okay. and a tolerance for pain. So okay. um, I'm not sold. <laughs> yeah, I, I wouldn't be. So um, okay, so thoughts. So talking about thoughts. So obviously, you'll notice that thoughts occur, right? So thoughts occur. The mind continues to create thoughts. Thoughts occur now. Um, about sort of an interesting thing. Thoughts of past and future occur now. Mm -hmm. Really cool thing to notice. And thoughts are very small. Most of the time, they're very transient, but we can actually tune out our whole body and world and mind and actually sort of disappear into the realm of thought. So when people say, oh, can I be there without my body? Well, you've, tons of people have had experiences all day long where they sort of disappeared into their daydreams or their fantasies or their speculations or their reminiscences or their obsessions or whatever and totally lost track of their body and the world around them and disappeared into their thoughts and then kind of come back. And people do this all the time when they argue or get really angry. The vast majority of the time, people are kind of really losing um, a sense of the space they're in and kind of disappearing into the stories that they're telling themselves in their minds, however true or not true. And so we're actually used to tuning out our body almost entirely all day long in the, and disappearing into the realm of thought and speculation and worry and um, sadness and reminiscence and, and memory. And that's called, so, so, sorry, that's something called the default mode network. And it's, it's, you know, this is a neuroscience thing, but people have studied this and shown that a lot of the time we're actually in this sort of space where we're kind of barely in our body, barely in our sensate world um, other than and kind of lost in sort of ruminating repetitive thought patterns for a lot of our lives. And so weirdly enough, when you say, oh, it was kind of weird being without a body, well, actually, if you're like nearly everybody, then a lot of the day, you actually are not really noticing your body at all. Hmm. And instead are noticing the music or noticing a thought or noticing whatever it is. And in that moment, you turned, tuned out your body. If you go looking for your body, oh, there's my body. But while you were in that thought, yeah, not so much. If you actually notice, if you could sort of, you know, take a picture, a three-dimensional picture of what your actual experience was, what your brain was experiencing, and show you, you'd be like, oh, no, it was totally gone into this thought for a moment, and then my body kind of came back as I came out of that. So we're coming in and out of bodily awareness all the time. That's kind of a normal part of how our brains function. But in terms of, so awakening and thought, that's a really interesting topic because there's all these different models of how thought will occur. If you go kind of Ramana Maharshi or whatever, or some of the, you know, Vedanta kids, they'll talk about like, you know, stopping thought or no thought. Some of the Zen people will kind of sometimes go there as well. Uh, You can find it in a lot of various spiritual traditions and strains and teachers and stuff. And they'll talk about stopping thought and say, you can't be awakened and have any thoughts. Well, and then there's this whole other school that I happen to just personally like a whole lot better. I'm showing my preferences, but there you go. It's honest. Mm -hmm. Um, Where you start to notice that thoughts are just a natural, causal, subtle, transient part of this wide open, manifesting, natural, causal field of experience. And they're not any problem as long as we don't Um, create any sense of a stable, continuous self out of them. Um, And as long as we relate to them in some kind of wise way from a sort of relative morality training point of view. Mm -hmm. And so you kind of need both when dealing with thoughts or with anything from that matter. Both are useful. It's good to have the insights that can recognize thoughts as just being what they are, subtle, transient, causal sensations that arise and vanish. Cool, fine, whatever. And um, don't need to cause any more trouble than just, you know, some more sensations happening because, you know, thoughts don't 
hurt in any normal kind of a way. They can kind of cause emotional bodily pain and stuff. But um, the thoughts themselves, like, really? That's hurting you? That's causing all your suffering? No, actually. Mm -hmm. The way we relate to those that try to attempts to make ourselves out of them can sort of tie us into complicated knots, and then we can run into all kinds of trouble. But if you perceive thoughts clearly, they're just these little things. <laughs> and so... The issue is coming downstream. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, in your book, you talk about noting, which is the practice of noting mentally every single sensation in the body as it arises. And you talk about getting this up to speeds of up to 15 times per second. Now, this is... Or 20 find, or 40. Or 20 or 40. Wow, okay. I find this so interesting, but uh, also seems a little bit daunting as I've, I've given it a, a crack, but it seems like my mind has the same limitations as my mouth would have if I were trying to speak 15 words per second. Do you have any tips to like to increase the speed or to remove this link between, you know, the sort of verbal link that I have with thoughts in my head? Yeah. So initially when people start noting, you're going to, you're going to, if you're going to use full words, you start slow. That's a thought. So noting is this technique that actually comes out of a, um, a sutra called One by One as They Occurred, which you can find in the Majimini Kaya Middle Length Discourses of the Buddha, and then was uh, popularized by Lady Sidao and then Mahasi Sidao as, as these Burmese um, people who noticed, wait, if you take an ordinary layperson and put them on a three-month retreat and have them just note their experience all day long, 50% of them will get stream entry. Right, right? Okay. This was kind of like, this is kind of what put Mahasi on the map in addition to being a genius and an amazing scholar and a fantastic practitioner and all these other things. But that was like, from my point of view, the most, and, you know, also really good at just describing thing, you know, meditative states and uh, really straightforwardly and clearly. So actually Mahasi had all these amazing aspects, but, but the thing that, really even put him on the map more than all his other amazing aspects was noticing this thing. If you just take ordinary Burmese people, and this is what he was doing in Burma, you know, in the 40s and 50s or 60s, wherever, however, you know, back in the day, and you put him in a monastery and you just have him note all day long, they wake up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so you can, you can, you know, people can say, oh, it's not original Buddhism. Oh, he just made this technique up or uh, whatever, but it works. So like, I'm a pragmatist. I care more than anything <laughs> yeah. that it just works. And that Westerners, not quite so much. So it's about 10% of Westerners in the same setting will wake up. Um, and th that's because we philosophize. We don't follow instructions. We make everything's outrageously complicated. We get in our own way. But right. if you can actually just make things simple and just follow the technique, people just wake up. They start getting stages of awakening. It's kind of, it's almost mechanical. You can watch them just go through the stages of insight and they wake up if you do the technique. So it's, if you can, you know, get over yourself and your issues and actually just practice, then people can wake up doing the simple thing. But it's noting is where you would go, okay, here's my foot, you know, rising, moving, falling. Here's my breath, rising, 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 falling, falling, falling. Here's thoughts, thinking. Here's sight, seeing. Here's feeling. Here's, you know, each of the sensations. Here's smelling. Here's tasting. Um, here's standing. Here's sitting. You, you just note these very simple things. But people start to notice, okay, wait a second. The mind is actually noticing a lot more than I can note, right? So mm -hmm. people start to go, okay, thinking, feeling, seeing things, seeing, seeing, you know, seeing, thing, you know, feeling, uh, seeing, <laughs> yeah. hearing, hearing. And then... At some point, they go, okay, no, wait, I'm perceiving faster than that. So so noting is really slowing me down. And then what I actually recommend people do is either note generally, but keep the noticing of the sensations at a direct level, or you could strip it down to just something quick like BIP. So whenever a sensation arises visually, and this kind of sounds kind of like a, a weird thing to do unless you really get into the practice, start noticing, okay, no, I really need to do that because I my brain's starting to get faster now as I get better and better at noticing sensations. Uh, I need to just strip this down to like bip. And so you can just go bip, 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 bip. It's all these sensations, visual or auditory or tactile or, you know, thoughts or whatever arise. You know, breath, bip, 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 bip. You can start to notice it really fast. And if you get your bips fast enough, then you can, and you do this long enough, all of a sudden the bips will start happening automatically or the notes will start happening automatically. And then when you tap into that kind of power, just like if I think about typing, I'm just a slow to medium typer. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. But if I do not think about typing, I'm just like thinking about what I'm typing or what I'm going to type or whatever and ignore my fingers, I can type like 120 words a minute. I'm crazy yeah. fast. Yeah. But I can't do it and consciously think about it, but my fingers can do it. 
Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah, totally. Where you see sense. these, you see these shredders, right? Like these people who play Flight of the Bumblebees at 900 beats per minute. <laughs> yeah, Have yeah. you seen these videos? Oh, yeah. Or 1600. I just saw this Indian kid do it at 1600. I was like, <laughs> wow. 1600 yeah. beats per minute. He's playing Flight of the Bumblebees. Like, yeah. unbelievable. There's no way he's thinking about that. <laughs> yeah. y- your brain isn't that, your linear, like, stupid brain is not that fast, but his fingers <laughs> yeah. are, yeah. right? His fingers are that fast. And it turns out, you can get noting to run automatically that fast if you strip it way down. It will start matching the speed of stuff that's way faster than you initially thought you could do it. Just so if you play a number of instruments, right? The first time you tried to, do you play guitar, for example, or keyboard? Sure. What do you play? Guitar. What yeah. do you play? Guitar. The first time you ever tried to make a G chord, right? Yeah, You're yeah, like, yeah. you know, bending your fingers and they won't go in the right place. And it took yeah. you like 10 seconds probably to get your fingers there. Right. Well, after you'd practiced for a while, you could do a G chord in less than a second, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And now you can do a, a G chord in probably like a quarter second or a tenth of a second, right? And the first time you ever did a like you know an E major scale or whatever, right, or a C major scale, right? It was really slow. It was like yeah, yeah. ding, 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 ding. Yeah. Right. But as you practice, all of a sudden, like you know, before you know it, you're shredding or whatever, yeah. and yeah. and so just like any of these skills where we can learn to get much, much faster at them. Um, or reading, right? The first time any of us read, it was like C-A-T, spells mm-hmm. cat, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> we were really slow. And now I can, you know, read a page and, you know, over 30 seconds or whatever of a standard side book or less than that, you know, if I really get into it. And how many characters I'm reading per second? I don't know. It's a lot. Right? I, can, <laughs> yeah. I can read lines in a second. I mean, so how many characters I'm reading per second? I have no idea, but it's, it's many, many characters. And so for there are plenty of other ordinary activities that we do all day long, driving, think about how, how many sensations per second you're noticing when you're driving and how you're coordinating your hands and feet and pedals and all this stuff, right? And looking around and mirrors and following distances and speeds and checking. I mean, like there's all this stuff happening really fast. Many times a second, we're doing all this complicated stuff. And yet, if once you practice driving, you, that's just normal. The same thing with noting. You can, you can practice noting and initially it seems clunky and slow and difficult, just like trying to form that G chord or trying to play that first scale. But soon enough, all of a sudden you realize, oh no, wait, uh, my mind can do noting and noticing my sensate information coming in, my six sense doors, fast like it types on my phone with my two thumbs, or fast like it, I can read, or fast like I can drive a car. The same kind of processing power starts to come online. And when that comes online, suddenly you can start to notice, okay, wait a second, all these little sensations that they said were not me, really, they're really kind of not me. Oh, wait, check this out. Mm-hmm. I can really start to notice this in real time. I can notice some tensions arising naturally before actions. I can notice mental impressions following sensations. I can notice all these little things arising and vanishing. I can notice this sense of attention and perspective kind of moving around really fast around my head and nose and sinuses and tongue and mouth and hair and, you know, chest and neck and wherever it's, you know, the sense of eyes flying all over the place. Like, yeah. really? Yeah, like, yeah, sure. And none of those sensations hold up. And then you can actually start to notice the beginning and the full ending of each of these little sensations really quickly, like happening at this amazing speed. And you can start to get up to the kind of resolution that really cuts through experientially directly for yourself, that sense of self, right? That sense that I really am the stable thing made out of all these sensations, even though I can't figure out which one of those I really am. But, you know, you can really start to debunk the the whole absurd process and, and that can make things a whole lot better. And so that's sort of how noting works and how you can get much, much, much better at it if you just practice it in sufficient dose. And retreats help a lot for this, but plenty of people in daily life can make good progress if they just put in the time. Yeah, thanks for that. That makes a lot of sense, actually. I wasn't sure if disassociating sort of verbal language was the way to go, but it seems like it's it's the only way to go at a certain point. So I thought we might be able to get into some, is it jhana? Is that how you pronounce it, right? Yeah, jhana Jana's, or dhyana. Dhyana, if you want to Diana. be Sanskrit here, but I like jhana because I'm Jana. more Pali most of the time. Uh, okay, okay. I'll pretend like I know the difference. Um, <laughs> jhana. Okay, so uh, the jhana section of your book speaks of some pretty high level closed eyes visualization. I was wondering if you might have some tips for someone that finds it hard to visualize to begin with. Is it like, is it dissimilar to the noting? Is it just a matter of practice? Yeah, it's definitely a learnable skill, but it benefits tremendous. Okay, so all of the fancy concentration stuff benefits tremendously from high doses in short periods of time and really good conditions. So there's stuff I can get into on retreat 
that it takes me about a hundred hours to get to, something like that, that I I just can I can get hints of now. I can get flickers of, but not stable and awesome and fully formed with um, you know immaculate control like I can on retreat. And mm-hmm. and that's basically everybody who does this stuff, you, you've got what you can learn to do in daily life. Okay, cool. But then on retreat, like if you give me, you know, 12, 14 hours a day for a week, suddenly I'm a totally different meditator and you give me two weeks, whoa. Like suddenly I can, you know, visualize amazing things with amazing detail. And for, I'm going to shameless plug for two things. First, shameless plug number one, www.firecasina, F I R E K I K A S I N A. So, firecasina, mm-hmm. F I R E K A S I N A dot org is a place where you'll find all kinds of reports of people learning to visualize by looking at a candle flame, closing their eyes, seeing the after image, and, and then just taking that from there, um, including myself. And you'll also find for free, um, a copy of a book I did with a really cool meditator and teacher named Shannon Stein, who uh, we wrote a book, or she wrote a lot of it actually, um, but worked with me, uh, called The Fire Casino. And so it's a book about using a candle flame and developing visualization skills. Most people find it really hard to visualize, and most people find it weirdly easy to visualize, or at least to get some visual stuff going using a candle flame. And you can see all the techniques and stuff described in there. That's my favorite thing. If people want to visualize well and actually like learn to see, you know, the tantric Buddha images or learn to, you know, draw pentagrams in the air if you're a wizard or, you know, a cultist, <laughs> or learn to draw symbols in the air or learn to, you know, do whatever it is you want to do. Um, that's a really cool technique for just building up the basic skills of seeing stuff that most people would say is not there. Great. I'm definitely going to check that out. Um, by the way, if you've got any other plugs, just, just go ahead. Just as we go through, don't, you don't have to, uh, don't have to apologize. It's just okay, cool. a- any resources, any cool books, any websites, whatever, just, just, just yeah, it out there. it's all, it's all free. And on the, on the website, firecasino.org, you'll find, um, uh, audio diaries and written reports and all kinds of cool stuff. So, okay. and and that's a fun technique that a lot of people can get. All of a sudden, they're like, "Wow, I'm seeing this red dot." So, cool. you know, I'll just go ahead and say it because I, I just love talking about the fire casino. Awesome. That's one of my favorite concentration exercises for anybody who wants to learn to visualize anything, including you Tibetans out there who think you're somehow above Theravadan practices. They could really help you. <laughs> That's my quick plug. So, so you take a candle, uh, you look at it, you look at the flame for a minute or two, um, you close your eyes, you see the after image, and then you follow that after image. Wherever the colors go, whatever they do, however they change, you follow them. Mm -hmm. Um, with your eyes closed. And then they, for most people, you get a red dot and then some gold stuff in the center of it and then some green and blue stuff around it. And it'll move off to the side and do all this weird stuff and disappear and reappear and shimmer and twist and do all this complicated stuff. And then it'll go away. And then you open your eyes, you look at the candle flame for a minute or two, you get the retinal burn, you close your eyes and then you do it again. And what's interesting is people will say, oh, that's just, you know, sort of visual purple after images. Except it's not. So visual purple after images don't move and wiggle and change and change colors in that kind of way. The visual, you know, sort of the um, complementary color of a yellow candle flame is not red. It would be, you know, dark bluish purple, mm-hmm. right? The inverse. Except what, yeah, the, in, yeah. the inverse color, the anti-color, complementary color, whatever you want to call it, mm-hmm. right? So it would be dark purple or black or something, it's not red, right? right? So it's, and it's certainly not yellow. When you start seeing yellow stuff, that's the same color. Okay, wait, that's something <laughs> you're creating in your brain. And when you see the green stuff around it, that's also not the anti-color or, or complementary color of yellow. And so, um, and then, so then there's all kinds of instructions for cool stuff you can do out past that. And you just do this cycle again and again and again. When you lose anything organized, you open your eyes and you look at the candle flame minute or two, close your eyes and just cycle, cycle, cycle. And more hours in a short space of time makes for better practice. So high concentration is a fragile thing for most people. The real high advanced concentration stuff of advanced visualization is the kind of stuff that on retreat you can learn to do, doing it in daily life much more tricky. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, high concentration and the really advanced visual stuff and, and state stuff, most people need pretty good conditions to great conditions and need high dose in short period, meaning, 
you know, I, what I think of that as, you know, 12 to 16 hours a day. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so, which is my idea of a good time. <laughs> Does this increased visualization capability bleed through to other aspects of, of life and like memory? Like, do you get better memory of text or faces or images and dreams, things like this? Oh, yeah. So if you start playing around with the high concentration stuff, it is definitely possible to start seeing things, right? So people, this is this is going to get, for people who are not into woo-woo, here's a warning. <laughs> I'm about to get okay. pretty woo-woo, okay? <laughs> let's, let's and you can right. call it hallucinations or crazy or whatever you want, but here we go. Okay. <laughs> so if you start visualizing a lot and doing a lot of candle flame practice or any kind of advanced visualization practice where you're actually really seeing stuff, yeah, okay, more vivid dreams. Yeah, more lucid dreams. But yeah, more hypnagogic images, but then there's all the other stuff, right? You could literally start seeing things and hearing things, and how you want to relate to those is your own business, but I would recommend something skillful and reasonable and kind. You can start seeing and hearing entities, particularly if you mix a mantra with this stuff. You can start jumping out of body and having out-of-body experiences. You can start seeing auras and other complicated energy things. You can start seeing all kinds, like, it can get pretty trippy. So don't go messing around with these things unless you want to enter a semi-magical universe of experience. And whether or not that's real or not, I really am uninterested in. It's clearly causal, right? So people seeing stuff, there's causality there. And mm -hmm. like when you see your chakras in your body suddenly, you know, or whatever, and you start manipulating them, your body will start doing weird stuff and changing. And like, you're like, oh, whoa, I move this energy channel. I turn it from blue to green. And then I connect those two energy channels. And all of a sudden my shoulders like relax, check that stuff out. So, you know, people can, you know, go, oh, that's all woo woo and crazy or whatever. Yeah. Except actually this, there's some fascinating things you can learn to do in this. That's a whole nother gigantic topic that is so vast, I, I don't even know where to begin. But just realize that if you start doing these kinds of practices, that's where magic is, right? And so mm -hmm. you start to realize why the old texts are chock a block full of magic and beings and other realms and all this stuff. It's because if you do this stuff well, that's the world a lot of people will start finding themselves in and experiences you can start having. Mm -hmm. So it's not random that the old Buddhist um, you know, monks and nuns were having those experiences because they were doing advanced concentration stuff. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, that's fascinating. Um, speaking of entities and, and things of the like, I saw a blog post that you wrote back in 2016 uh, comparing Pokemon Go to tantric, shamanistic, and animistic <laughs> practice of capturing entities and demons. Yeah, um, yeah and and imperialism, right? Talking about imperialism. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. But and you also yeah, mentioned yeah. you also mentioned like friends that kill countless <laughs> virtual beings in video games, but consider themselves moral in the real world. Sure. Uh, and I suppose like some would argue that it's a cathartic and potentially stress relieving activity to absolutely engage they in do. violence in video games while remaining moral in the real world. I'm I'm curious where you, where you're sitting now with that one. Is it is it immoral to to kill pixels, <laughs> or is it is it bad for the mind? Yeah, that's a fascinating question. Or is it just a really skillful way to work out aggression? I am mm. fully prepared to argue that in depth either way, which would be more fun. Okay, right. So you're so you're um, on the fence. Um, I'm not sure I'm on the fence as I think both points of view have validity. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh so for example, I'm a I'm a person who has a lot of reasonably or sometimes horribly violent dreams. I don't have as many of them as I used to. Mm -hmm. So it's it's par for the course for me in dreams to kill people, to tear their hearts out, to rip off an arm and beat them to death with it, to blow some you know somebody's body to fragments of meat with lightning bolts to do whatever. That's that's well within my normal dream repertoire. I don't know what that says about me, except when I do a lot of meta practice, when I'm more likely to make friends with these beings that under normal circumstances I might have killed or torn apart or done some other horrible thing to um, meta practices, which meta for those of you who are not polyglots or whatever is loving kindness practices where you're practicing just sending loving kindness to yourself or various categories of beings or all beings. Um, and I find the dreams where I have the sort of more meta -y reaction, vastly more enjoyable, peaceful, better in all ways. So 
versus when I've seen really scary movies that say involve, you know, horror stuff or whatever, I'm more likely to have the kind of dreams that involve carnage. Right, okay. Um, And so uh, I can watch the causality within myself and my dream world, which I think is probably some reflection of my subconscious world. I'm not the first to have thought that, mm. right? And, I, you know, Jung, et cetera, Freud, blah, blah, mm. um, and lots of other people long before that, right? So it's nothing new. Um, I, there's, I think there is some connection between the things that we feed our brain, the conditioning, the patterns, the mirror neurons that watch various ways to relate to other people, and the way we train ourselves and the way we interact with other people Mm -hmm. and the way we do things in life. Are video games some freakish exception to that rule? Maybe. Maybe they're just incredibly perfectly cathartic and why are no other unfortunate behaviors? Uh, I would be surprised (laughs) if that was perfectly true. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Not that they may not be tremendous fun, but I have some skepticism that somehow the subconscious mind is perfectly immune from that level of, um, you know, uh, conditioning. It would. It would also. I, I think it would depend on the definition of the game and, and the realism in the game too, and how gory sure. and, and violent it is. Like something yeah. like Space Invaders is pretty different from something like. I guess the latest version of Grand Theft Auto, for example, right? Or, there, or there's even there's even more intensely violent games in Grand Theft Auto, in which you are meant to torture and murder people, etc. So I, yeah. I, I suppose maybe the maybe it's the the realism and the content of the games that that maybe determines that. You know, sure. I'm not, I'm not really and sure. And could I could I equally make an argument that by getting in touch with those sides of ourself, we have an opportunity to bring consciousness and clarity and, you know, um, wisdom to those sides of ourselves that otherwise we may not be as in touch with. Okay, I can make those kinds of arguments if, if doing that in a skillful way on a screen rather than, you know, in real life somehow mm-hmm. allows us to integrate those sides of ourselves. I don't know. I mean, there's there's lots of complicated ways you can argue this. And I think un, I'm guessing that what reality is is some complicated amalgam of those that that neither file falls on one side or the other, but involves some mix of all of those perspectives to get at what's really going on. Yeah, sure. I mean, like, didn't Jung, Jung argued and his, his sort of vision of enlightenment was that you have to kind of integrate and accept the shadow side of yourself and accept yeah. that you could be the worst and most uh, you know, horrific being sure. that exists and, and you have the capacity to do that. And, oh, yeah. um, you know, he, he I, I think he argued that everyone has to accept that they have the capability within themselves to cause immense harm and the worst evil on the planet. And once you accept that, you can actually be at peace with that more than more than hiding it, hiding it or, or pretending that it doesn't exist. Uh, what do you think about that? Like, I, I'm right there with uh, Young on that point. Mm-hmm. So, and if video games help with that work, help uh, expose and integrate our shadow sides, cool, fine. Yeah. If they're cathartic, <laughs> yeah. cool, fine. If they help us, uh, you know, vent skillful aggression that our, that we would otherwise have taken out on our boss or our partner or our parents or children or whoever, okay, fine. But that you know, so it's it's probably. I, yeah, I can make all those arguments for those things, but still, like, do I do I think that there is no negative conditioning that's going on by um, killing thousands of whatever they are? Is, yeah, <laughs> probably is also some, some negative habitual conditioning. Yeah, sure, sure. I've, it's interesting that you mention those kind of dreams because I have a friend who's had recurring nightmares, horrific apocalyptic nightmares for years, like over a decade, I believe. And it's really affected his life in a negative way. It's really uh, caused a, a lot of grief and a lot of stress. And you hmm. mentioned, so, so you mentioned loving kindness or, or meta meditation as a, that's helped you with, with your, I mean, like, it seems like you're fine with your dreams. They don't cause you any trauma and your any bleed through into your normal life. Um, was that always the case or did you figure out a way how to accept them and, and deal with them a, a bit more easily? Um, I wouldn't say they don't cause any bleed through into my ordinary life, but I'm not particular. I'm not. I'm not as troubled by them as plenty of people might be, con- particularly considering uh, their content. But in terms of meta practice, making them better, I first noticed this when I first started. This is in the '90s somewhere when I first started doing a lot of meta practice. I got um, uh, so. 
um, Salzberg's book, uh, Loving Kindness, The Revolutionary Art of Happiness. And, and I started doing the exercises in that nice little book. And I remember the first time that I had a dream where things went very, very differently. So I was in this um, big like if you took a gigantic abandoned industrial plant with all these rusted staircases and weird mm-hmm. pipes and and stuff that looked like it had been rusting for 200 years or something, and then you made this a gigantic box of sort of warehousey looking industrial plant-like stuff floating in space. And I was just sort of wandering around this thing, and there was nobody around at all, I thought. And all of a sudden, these three guys... Um, with sort of long black leather dusters who clearly look like they're uh, up to no good, come up the staircase suddenly from around this corner and, and there they are right in front of me. And they're like, and then they, they, they looked at me and they got this look of mischief in their eye and they said, ah, let's get him. Mm-hmm. So ordinarily what would have happened next would have involved a lot of carnage, some, mm-hmm. like something out of a video game, the mm-hmm. bad end of video games. Instead... Like, I've been doing these practices a lot, and I've been doing them that night before I went to sleep. I just sort of decided in my dreams, like, as a totally different reaction to them, radiated loving kindness. Okay, the net effect of which was because, okay, so this is sort of dream world, right? Weird things happen. Mm. All of a sudden, I became, like, transparent to them because my their angry energy and my loving kindness energy were so different that it was like I was on some loving kindness plane and they were on the angry warrior fight attack people bandit plane or something mm-hmm. and they just walked right through me and they were like hey where'd he go and I turned around and I was looking at them and it was like they were like a ghost to me or like I was like a ghost to them because my loving energy was so different from their angry energy and they just sort of got confused and wandered away and I didn't kill anybody or do anything horrible and <laughs> and it was like okay this is changing something like this is this practice is changing something in my psyche I had never had that reaction before and I was like okay that's way way better I need to do more of that <laughs> wow that's so interesting what a crazy place to end up in, uh, like a steampunk warehouse and floating in space with mischievous bandits, bandits trying to attack you. That's, so cool. that's kind of my normal that's so dreamscape. That's, really? That's, that's well within my ordinary, yeah, dream stuff. Wow, interesting. And so you, have you found that, that, that this sort of loving kindness meditation, that the more you do that, the more it influences your dreams? Yeah, and yeah. I think everything else. I think it interacts my interactions with people and the way I relate to myself and my own experience and feelings and heart and body and um, pain and everything. I think it's very, very transformative and highly, highly recommended. Sure, cool. I will recommend that to my friend. I mean, he'll probably listen to this anyway, but if he doesn't, I I will recommend he checks that stuff out. So moving on. So Buddhism has this imperative to awaken all beings. And I find this a noble goal, and it brings up some interesting questions. And the first one that I had is, uh, would non-humans such as animals and their natural habitat be considered awake or enlightened? Yeah, so like if you, you know, were paying attention to Krishnamurti, he'd be like, you know, all the animals knew their place in the cosmos except man. You know, Mm, I remember reading this quote in one of his little books somewhere. Okay, so that would be his take on it. I don't know how he would know. Maybe he does, whatever, or how he knew. I guess he's dead now, but anyway. And then you've got the Buddhist take on it. So the Buddhist take on this would be that there are sort of six realms of existence, of which the animal realm is too dull uh, for awakening. It's just um, the mind is not sharp enough. It's not clear enough. There is not enough um, ability to get out of the basic cycle of survival and food and reproduction and, and, you know, just the sort of ordinary functions of an animal, you know, plus some rudimentary social function. Um, not that there aren't some really, really smart animals. It turns out there really are crows and, you know, German shepherds and all these octopuses and whatever, and whales, I think, you know, dolphins. Okay, so so some animals may be much smarter than I think they were thinking about back in the day. Mm-hmm. But, um, but still, like, so the concept of animal awakening in general, the sort of stock and standard Buddhist view, just kind of reciting the dogma, would be that they would need a human rebirth or perhaps a 
a really skillful godly rebirth. But in general, within Buddhism, it's considered that the human condition, the human realm, uh, the human rebirth is the optimal balance of uh, pleasure and pain with enough intelligence in general and sort of a balance of factors that make awakening the most possible so that you're not up in the God realms. So if you you know talk about the six realms from a Buddhist point of view, you'd have the God realms where there's so much pleasure and there's so much ease and there's so much peace and there's so much longevity and there's such a sense of splendid, you know, immortality, not quite, but almost, that, you know, there's just not sufficient impetus to get awakened because there's not enough suffering. And then you have the sort of hell realms and hungry ghost realms where there's so much pain that there's no way a mind can be sufficiently equanimous or balanced to awaken. And then you've got the animal realms that are too dull. They just don't have enough cognitive or, you know, sort of power to understand the the words of the teachings of the Buddha and then apply them in some metacognitively sophisticated way that allows you to, you know, judge your life properly and apply you know, verbal or written teachings to it in that kind of way. Mm-hmm. And so, the, you know, sort of standard Buddhist dogma 101 would be um, that animals know they, they should hope for a good human rebirth or a low-level god rebirth with sufficiently good karma to be able to practice as a low-level god. <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> anyway, if that's helpful. I guess my question was, was more along the lines of, uh, you know, in some spiritual sort of people that I've come across, they think that humans are uniquely, they're in a unique space of suffering compared to animals in their natural environment. They wouldn't need to awaken in a way because they're just part of the whole natural system and they're constantly in some kind of a flow state. They, they can't think, they're not trapped in thought, they're not trapped in this cycle of suffering. That's kind of where I was curious if that's a thing or if yeah. that's not a thing, you know. Countless people have very reasonably assumed that their cats or dogs are way more emotionally mature and spiritually sophisticated than they are. Yeah. (laughs) And it is very easy to make that argument. Yeah, 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 exactly. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Okay. Let's move on. Um, (laughs) um, Yeah, so it, it seems the path which you've laid out in your book, or many of these more intensive spiritual paths, would take a considerable amount of time and mental and physical energy to see through to the point of awakening. Um, so due to this, it seems like it would be impossible for large sections of the human population to become awakened, namely those with disabilities, severe mental illnesses or traumas and stuff like that. Is there an answer to this? They simply have to wait Um I don't know. And on a related note to that, I mean, how transhumanist are you? Like, let's say we invent technology that allows every newborn child to be physically healthy and intelligent with their basic needs met. Do you think that that would be something that we should should pursue, some kind of technological leveling of physical and mental ability? Uh, by leveling, I assume you mean upgrading and enhancing. Yeah, 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 yeah definitely. <laughs> definitely an upgrade. Um, uh, so I, I, you know, I'm, I'm a doctor, so I, we go out of our way to apply all kinds of advanced techniques to try to make people, you know, better than they might otherwise yeah, be sure. in terms of, you know, their how their health is doing or how they're going to face some illness or, you know, what happens as they get older or make their bones better, their cholesterol better, their sugar better, their weight better, their, you know, mental stuff better. I mean, so that's obviously the business that I've been in for. Uh, quite a while. Um, And we hope that business continues to get more sophisticated so that there can be less physical suffering and more health and mental and physical well-being. Um, So yeah, I think all those technologies are likely a good thing. If we can figure out how not to overrun the planet and exhaust all of its resources, that's kind of the the big challenge. Hmm. Um, uh, Where were we? Oh, you were talking about um, uh, like... uh, So people who have a hard time cognitively or whatever awakening, yeah, yeah, it's going to be more challenging. Although um, there's a, so, but a lot of really smart people are really, really challenged when it comes to awakening, right? Mm -hmm. So, so I've been on plenty of retreats where the smartest people in the room were the worst practitioners. Mm Mm-hmm. Because they overthought the whole thing. They had relied on their intellect, their, you know, extremely sophisticated, high-powered intellects and analytical abilities for their lives, for everything else. And then they relied on it. They try to rely on it for this, which is 
something outrageously simple. And there's the story in the Buddhist time of um, this guy who had a brother um, who ordained as a monk, and he was really uh, simple, not uh, not smart, not an intellectual powerhouse, let's just say. Right. And the Buddha gave him this really simple meditation of just rubbing this cloth on a rock or whatever. And, and because this guy is not overthinking anything, he just followed instructions and did this simple thing and was able to wake up far faster than his very intellectually sophisticated brother. And I noticed this in myself. So you know, I obviously, if you know, I became a doctor and whatever, I mm. got some intellectual was given some intellectual uh, horsepower and uh, gifts that are easy to inappropriately use in the face of simple meditation instructions, right? Mm -hmm. And so try to compensate with intellect for lack of following incredibly cave simple instructions. It turns out that doesn't work well. And I remember being on this retreat and there were some people on this retreat who did not seem to demonstrate any great degree of intellectual or philosophical sophistication, though maybe they were, I didn't get to interact with them that much. But they actually followed instructions, whereas I was thinking about a lot of stuff most of the time mm -hmm, for a while mm -hmm, until mm -hmm. I started noticing, wait a second, these people are clearly blowing me out of the water when it comes to how well they're doing from a meditative point of view. And oh, wait, they describe following the instructions. And oh, wait, I'm overthinking all this. Mm -hmm. So the reason for the vast discrepancy between, you know, if you take the average Asian uh you know, Burmese person, and you compare them to the upper middle class, hyper intellectual, you know, very accomplished, usually affluent Westerners who wander over to Burma and attempt to do the same thing, and they don't follow instructions and they overthink everything, and their meditation progress is vastly slower than people who are just uh, have a lot of faith. The teacher gives them a simple instruction, they follow that simple instruction all day long they do way better. And so intellectual power is not necessarily um, valuable in the same kind of way when doing insight practices. It's mm -hmm. valuable for lots of other things. There are lots sure. of things where it's, it's good to be smart, yeah, but yeah. This, is not, this is not one of them. Okay. And, and in fact, people, so countless, how, how many really smart, geeky, technical people have you know, picked up my book, gotten even more jacked up on a ton of intricate Dharma theory, wandered into some monastery, now like unbelievably arrogantly, such as Pandita Ramalamini or wherever, and um, and totally overthought the whole thing and tried to hyperanalyze everything and really practiced very poorly and been outrageously disrespectful and really done terribly from an insight point of view in comparison to plenty of people who didn't go in armed with all that theory, knowledge, and, or intellect who followed simple instructions and just totally blew them out of their water. Um, I, I have tons of reports of this happening. So you got to be careful with assuming that, you know, intellectual powerhouse stuff is going to be helpful. Now, if you've got really severe brain damage and you can't even get it together or to hear understanding basic simple instructions, you know, notice the sensations of breathing, notice sensations arise and vanish. Those are not complicated instructions, right? Mm -hmm. That's really easy stuff. But you have to have at least some kind of basic mental function to, to get to that level to hear and understand that and apply that and... So I would say there are some sort of minimal requirements, but they're pretty minimal. Does that okay. make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Totally. So uh, anthropologist Robin Dunbar puts forth the argument that 150 is the number of individuals with whom any one person can maintain stable relationships. And, you know, this would, I guess, default extend to strong empathy as, you know, as well. And hence the limit at which we can truly feel empathy for others. Do you think that there's a biological limit to empathy? And do you think it would be a moral imperative to increase it technologically if it were possible? I think it would be a moral imperative to increase empathy technologically if it were possible. And I would also then like to increase equanimity simultaneously. Mm -hmm. So like the Brahma Viharas, so, so the Brahma Viharas are the divine abidings, which include loving kindness practice, as well as compassion practices, sympathetic joy practices, which is appreciating the successes of others and equanimity. And equanimity is there to counterbalance the others and make sure um, that, so empathy is this fascinating thing. So I have a few friends who are hyper empathic. They really actually feel other people's feelings, 
in this really unusual way, or at least mm -hmm. it seems unusual to me. It's not unusual to them. That's just the way they're kind of built. Um, it's sometimes, and, and uh, particularly this one friend who happens to be a doctor who talks about this, uh, it's a strange thing. It's a strange gift to have been given to really feel other people's feelings and emotions and empathize with them and sometimes even really get a sense of what their body is feeling. Um, that's a strange gift to have been given. And sometimes it can be distracting or kind of disconcerting or whatever. And so I think you've got if you're going to do something like that and actually increase this en masse to some high degree, you need to balance that out with some real equanimity because empathy can be actually the, the spectrum of how far empathy can go. I don't know that it has an end point, but I know people who are way far out there farther than I am. And it sounds strange, wondrous, and kind of disturbing sometimes too, depending yeah, sure. on what the other person is experiencing. But do I think increasing empathy is a good idea? Yeah. Do I, do I think that we can only f feel empathy for 150 people or something like that? Well, I don't know. I feel empathy for patient after patient after patient who comes to me and I see what, you know, three to 400 a month or something. So I'm talking um, more about, I guess, kind of a strong bonded embassy like you'd have with family members and close friends. Well, weirdly enough, uh, with family members, plenty of people in marriages, for example, or in, in relation, you know, other family relationships begin having less and less empathy and more and more anger and frustration. <laughs> so I'm not always sure that close relationships are necessarily more empathic relationships. Right, right. But I, I mean, just on a, I suppose this would extend to a world level where you have this sort of we've still got huge amounts of this sort of tribalism and separate groups and ethnic borders and all sorts of things going on. And, yeah. you know, this, this is yeah, frightening and dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. And, but, it, but it also seems to be part of our biology, right? Like we, we lived in these small hunter gatherer tribes and it seems like that's the way our circuits are built. Uh, I'm just curious if you'd agree with that and, and if there is some sort of biological limit that, to the amount of people that we can truly care about. Um, so I can or, only or speak not, from my own, like, I'm, I'm own experience, but like I, I've definitely found these practices have really changed the way I view um, nations and states and team loyalties and uh, races and religions. Um, again, it's hard to grade things on an absolute scale, but I can say that in a relative way, I find myself... Um, vastly more sort of broadly concerned with the human condition and vastly less concerned about some of the names or labels or ethnicities or whatever the standard concerns are, not that any of us are necessarily perfectly free of whatever unfortunate conditioning we come up in or find ourselves surrounded by. Um, but uh, in terms of relative, I at least have noticed in myself, it really feels different having done a lot of these things than practicing, you know, being empathic and compassionate and loving. I think they really can change the degree to which those kinds of boundaries and divisions seem relevant or important or real or helpful mm. and make them vastly less uh, sticky or um, stiff or divisive. Mm. Divisive? How do you pronounce that? Anyway, however you pronounce that. Divisive, I think. Um, yeah, <laughs> I hear it both ways. <laughs> right. So, um, uh, so uh, I think it is really important to, to try to figure out a way to make basic practices that increase these basic ethical components of our hearts and minds and re rewrite the conditioning that of whatever biology or society or whatever it is, or just habit or just ignorance that would make us um, more hateful or xenophobic or whatever it is. I think it's, it's clearly demonstrated you can change your brain. You can rewire your brain to be this, you know, this way or that way. And there are plenty of old, well-timed, you know, t old, well-tested, um, skillful technologies that can help you and all of us to be more loving and kind. And, you know, the fact that seriously, we consider that we might be ending the planet any day now through nuclear conflict. Uh, I mean, that's a sign that something has gone horribly wrong and that something is horribly wrong. Mm. 
you know, that the, the people in Hawaii, when the warning came out, had 38 minutes where they seriously believed that there was, you know, nuclear whatever happening and were calling their loved ones to say goodbye, that's that insane. that's a real possibility and believable, you know, to a massive population. Uh, that should tell us that we have a serious problem as a species yeah. and we need to just do whatever we can to try to mitigate that as best we can, lest we not only end life for ourselves, but most of the other species that are, are here now. Yeah. I guess I'm going with this is it's, it seems almost as if it's, uh, it's just the numbers of us. There's so many of us. And, you know, like, for example, if, if any of us, you know, were walking down the street and we saw a family member or a close friend, you know, on the street, living on the street somehow, you know, it's, it's very conceivable that we'd take them in and give them a place to stay and look after them and righty, righty, righty. But if you walk through any impoverished neighborhoods and anywhere around the globe and there's hundreds or thousands of these people, you get to a point where you can't, you couldn't possibly look at each of those people in the same way that you'd look at a family member or, or a close friend to the point of actually helping them. And that's where I'm wondering whether there is a biological sort of limit to, to empathy that we can feel for others. Um, I don't know. So like, let's say each of those people, you spent an hour and you sat down, so it may be circumstantial. What if it's, mm. there's some sort of sen artificial circumstantial something that you're putting in the scenario you were saying? Because if you weren't actually talking to people, if you weren't actually asking them, hey, what's going on with you? How are you? What's your life like? What are you feeling? Uh, what have you come from? Where are you going? What do you dream of? Like, you know, what's going on with you? Mm. If you actually sat down and asked them these questions and actually talked to them, would you find yourself empathizing with them in a way that you didn't? So is it our intrinsic capacity for empathy? Or is it just putting yourself in the situations where you actually get to talk to people and relate to people and understand that they're like you and get a better immediate understanding of them. So one of the curious things of being a doctor is you get to ask people, hey, how are you? What's going on? What yeah. brings you here? What's your emergency? Are you in pain? Where Are you nauseated? Are you confused? Like, what's happening with you? And they tell you their story as best they can, assuming they can talk, which not all of them can, but most of them. And you, you know, get to check that and you get to see, oh, wow, that hurts. That, wow, I can see the car. That looks like that hurts, you know, and oh, that sounds terrible. And I'm sorry, this is happening with you. And, and so I guess it might be possible to not be empathic for these people if one was cold and heartless or burned out or distracted or whatever, but, you know, come on, like, you know, and so uh, I feel that I can have empathy for, you know, all the people that I see mm. and get some sense, wow, okay, that, that hurts. That's no fun. That's bad. That's, you know, that's difficult. That's challenging and feel some degree of that. And I don't, maybe the limit is how much time you have. Yeah. And so maybe it's a limit on time more than it is on intrinsic capacity. Mm. Yeah. Maybe that's all it is. I mean, that's where I'm going with the amount of humans that there are. It's maybe it's simply just a logistical problem. Anyway, should we move on to, uh, I've got a question. I'm, I'm curious about food because Buddhism is generally associated with vegetarianism or, or veganism more these days, I suppose. Is it? But, well, I, I guess so, right? Like, like with vegetarianism is, is very synonymous with, with, uh, with Buddhism and from what I've read. Um, so I'm curious, like, do you have any experience with different types of food? Are, are you a vegetarian yourself? Come at me with, with the food thing. <laughs> Does it affect different food it, uh, affect your practice? Uh, fasting, et cetera. <laughs> oh, yeah. So the food thing. Yeah, the food thing's a huge thing. So just so you know, um, the Buddha was not vegetarian. Okay. Uh, the Buddha ate meat. Uh, the Buddha said, and actually a number of people in the early Sangha, in the time of the Buddha, if the texts are correct, said, Buddha, you got to make this whole thing vegetarian. Killing beings for our food is really karmically horrible and unethical, and you got to make this a vegetarian thing. And the Buddha said, nope, we are relying on donations, making these people make vegetarian food for us when they themselves are not necessarily vegetarians and they have to figure out how to eat and maybe they've got meat to eat and they might not have something else um, is uh, not something I'm going to do. And so as long as you don't kill it yourself, monks, you can eat meat. Crazy. And okay. so the early Sangha ate meat and the modern sanghas these days, the vast majority of them eat meat. So they're very, if you went to traditional Buddhist monasteries, except perhaps in Sri Lanka, 
um, which is sort of the notable exception, uh, you will find that in Thailand or Tibet or Dharamsala or Japan or Korea or China, wherever you find, you know, Cambodia, the vast majority of them are eating meat. And so um, uh, this notion, you know, vegetarianism clearly has lots of excellent ethical things to recommend it, not only from the point of view of the animals, but also the environment and energy resources and, and all kinds of stuff, right? There's all kinds of reasons to recommend vegetarianism. Uh, but the association, the strict association with it is in some ways a modern Western liberal you know, uh, concoction with the exception of the Sri Lankans. Okay. You see what I mean? Yeah, sure. Yeah. That's interesting. And so, um, uh, I myself was vegetarian for eight years and I found that if I didn't eat about a pound of tofu a day and get my protein content pretty high, then I was just walking around all day long with these crazy protein cravings mm -hmm. that were really distracting. And then eating that much soy gave me a goiter and screwed my thyroid up, I think permanently. <laughs> sure. And that was however many years ago, 16 years ago, and it hasn't been right since. Shit. And okay. so I then started eating some meat. And when you're in residency in medical school, it's, it's, you can be vegetarian, but it's really tricky given the stuff you find in hospital cafeterias and stuff. So that was kind of challenging. These days, I eat meat sometimes. I don't, I'll go days without eating it. My wife lives largely on beans, rice, and kale. And so when I'm at home, that's mostly what we eat. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes we'll cook chicken, but maybe once a week or something. So I'm kind of this, like, I, I say I have vegetar strong vegetarian tendencies, but I uh, don't live there all the time. Um, at some point, I may be vegetarian again. I know I, there are great arguments for it. Anybody who's out there doing vegetarianism, cool. Like, mm -hmm. it's, you know, there's, I can, lots of good arguments for it. And I would have made those arguments and can still make those arguments. So um, yeah, karmically, clearly the contributing to the killing of beings is no good thing. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and from the health of the planet point of view, from a resource point of view, from an energy cycle point of view, from a carbon cycle point of view, from a global warming methane gas emission point of view, from a waste point of view, there's all kinds of reasons to argue, you know, argue for vegetarianism. Mm, sure. uh, yeah, all good, all totally excellent, valid arguments. Is that helpful? Yeah, it was. It was. It's uh, very interesting. Um, yeah, I was curious if, uh, I mean, setting aside the vegetarianism thing, I'm curious if you've had experience with different types of food affecting practice and concentration. Yeah, no. no. Uh, well, okay, so the only thing is, uh, if you get too carb heavy, you can get these sort of sugar crashes, particularly on retreat. If you like totally carb up for your lunchtime meal, then you're going to be really sleepy an hour or two later, and it's just not as good. Definitely good to stay towards more of the vegetable protein side of things and get a little more keto, ketone stuff going. Yeah, yeah. Um, that would be my, and that's, so that's the downside of the vegetarian diet is, right? It's hard to get a high protein to carb ratio. Mm -hmm. That's pretty mm -hmm. tricky without mm -hmm. eating a whole ton of soy, which was what I found because I was trying to, you know, sort of do less carbs and more protein. And then I screwed my thyroid up. So <laughs> yeah. anyway, um, yeah, so it's, it's, and it, yeah, that's kind of my short take on it. Other than that, no. Like have I've you, eaten meat or not eaten meat on retreats. I don't find it makes any difference in my concentration at all. I Nothing against people who think it does. Yeah, okay. Well, that's that's super interesting. Have you had much experience with fasting? Um, yeah, I, I remember doing a 24-hour fast a very, very long time ago. I was a teenager. Otherwise, I don't fast much. But on retreat, you tend to eat two meals a day. So there's breakfast, lunch, and nothing after lunch. And so the lunch kind of becomes like a fast Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm one of these crazy high metabolism people that if uh, I don't eat, I very rapidly start feeling weird. And everybody says, oh, you'll adjust. Yeah, maybe. Um, right. But uh, yeah, I haven't no, not much experience with fasting personally beyond yeah. being on retreats and not eating after midday. Yeah, fair enough. Which is pretty stock and standard. Maybe that's intermittent fasting to some extent then. What about, uh, what about like coffee, ice cream, beer, any of those kind of things? Uh, so kind of delights mess with the concentration. <laughs> um, a lot of people think caffeine enhances concentration. It can also make people kind of edgy and more restless. So you got to kind of figure that out for yourself. 
if people have a caffeine tolerance and a caffeine dependence and they suddenly go on retreats and stop, they can get all these headaches and feel weird and stuff until they get over that. Mm-hmm. Or if people are not used to caffeine and they suddenly start ingesting a lot of it when they go on retreat, they can get all edgy and anxious and restless and, and all that. So, you know, this, uh, I th- you know, the reasonable advice is if you go on retreat and you're suddenly doing a lot of practice, keep your caffeine intake about whatever it typically is during the day. Is caffeine a good idea or a bad idea? We did this fascinating review on it when I was in epidemiology school and actually probably maybe a slightly good health idea, depending on the form you're getting in. And if you're getting in in tea or coffee or chocolate, probably yes. If you're getting in soft drinks, yeah, maybe not so much because mm-hmm. um, the other stuff in the soft drinks, whatever the phosphoric acid and sugar or artificial sweeteners or whatever, I don't want to get into that whole discussion. Oh, we don't need to. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but in terms of beer, like do I think know anybody who think beer is really enhancing their meditative practice? No. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure, um, sure. Yeah, I don't know anybody who thinks that's a good idea. <laughs> okay. And uh, uh, 10, you know, 10% of people who drink will become alcoholics. It's a, it's extremely common. So it's a moderate amount of risk there. And it's, well, the additional calories and the cancer risk and the other stuff, you know, but as a few, some people handle beers just fine and have no obvious bad effects. So you just kind of kind of figure out who you are and how it affects you. And um, yeah, that's a very individualized question. What were the other questions you had asked? Uh, that about covers the, the, food, the yeah. food part of it. Yeah, no, that's cool. Uh, getting some quite interesting parts here. So many monks practice celibacy and there's some pretty interesting stories over on the subreddit NoFap and there's a bit of a rabbit hole to do with Chinese semen retention and all sorts of stuff online. Oh yeah, the whole so, chi thing. Yeah, yeah the chi yeah. thing. And these are the yeah. same people who are into jing balls and all that or whatever. Yeah, there's right? all sorts Where of there's all sorts of yeah. talk about celibacy, sexual stuff. energy and yeah, Taoist stuff and yeah. And you know, I'm curious what what Buddhism has to say about celibacy and sexual energy and all that in, in relation to practice and yeah. So the, the the unique fascination of semen retention that you find in Taoism is not really found in <laughs> Buddhism in quite the same way, except to the small degree that it, it impacted some of the way esoteric Tibetan stuff. But that's pretty far out there. Um, in terms of Buddhism, the Buddha was said, you know, if you're a lay person in the lay life, you know, that's part of being a lay person. And if you're a monk, be celibate. Now, it has also been noted in modern times that the number of monks who say they're a celibate who are actually not is, you know, that's a whole nother thing. And mm-hmm. the number of, you know, young monks who, you know, become, you know, sort of hyper masturbators or whatever is routinely commented <laughs> on in the back rooms of uh, <laughs> monasteries. <laughs> and and will people find that surprising? The number of people, I don't mean to despair to monastic life, please. Uh, you know, obviously I can imagine the comments you're going to get on this part, um, you know, <laughs> but the number of people who report getting offered blowjobs when they go to theoretically celibate monasteries has been routinely commented on. Not that all people are all monasteries or whatever, but re- just realize that there may be the occasional person who's living less than the, uh, not entirely living up to the stated ideals of the tradition, to put it gently. Mm -hmm. Um, But plenty of people find a lot of comfort and a lot of validity and a lot of simple elegance and um, reduced distractions and reduced complexity by leading a celibate life. So that's the other side of the coin, right? So there are plenty of people who, when they give up, you know, chasing down their next one night stand or, you know, they're, you know, following whatever, you know, sected, you know, addictive or compulsive sexual behaviors. I don't want to get into the whole question of whether or not sex addiction is a real thing, but, you know, Mm -hmm. some people think it is and they, that's how they describe their own lives and how they relate to it. And so, um, they, you know, a lot of people find that very freeing and, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a lot of people, or when they get older, like, wow, how nice is it not to be, you know, nice is it not to be led around by one's genitalia and all kinds of unfortunate <laughs> situations, yeah, yeah. Uh, which people might have been earlier. And so, and then there's other people who relate to sexuality as like no problem whatsoever, totally an integral part of my spiritual practice. And I bring that, you know, the same mindful, compassionate wisdom to that that I bring to everything else. I just listened to this fascinating podcast on deconstructing yourself 
uh, with Michael Taft talking to Jessica Graham about uh, her new book, Good Sex, which is basically like trying to get people to meditate by talking about sexual stuff while also trying to bring real wisdom and kindness and, mm -hmm. and uh, awareness to um, integrated sexuality as a part of spiritual practice. That's and they're humbling. fascinating. Yeah, so like, and I think there's a lot of room for a wide diversity of valid perspectives if people are finding that those perspectives are achieving the goals that they want to achieve and working for them, right? Mm -hmm. The way we relate to sexuality, you know, not only as individuals, but at individual points or in specific and different points in our lives is vast and different you know, phases of practice and different phases of life and different situations, we can have very different relationships to sexuality, many of which may be very, very healthy and skillful, and many of which may not be. Mm. And so we just have to ask ourselves, honestly, is this leading to more suffering or more compassion and closeness and happiness and well-being? And that's not always an easy thing to answer, mm -hmm. but it's a good, good question to ask ourselves. Uh, there's a fascinating a book called Lust for Enlightenment by John Stevens, which I highly recommend. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very interesting take on uh, the various ways that some of the various strains of Buddhism, particularly the Theravadan and Zen, are the ones that mostly focuses on, uh, relate to sex. And then you've got the whole thing of the Tibetans and Tantra, which can be a really skillful thing, or as we read in the scandal sheets, sometimes a really scary, troubling, exploitive thing. So... Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, it's a, the question's all over the place, and I think there are lots of valid answers to the question. Mm -hmm. Was oh, that helpful? Cool. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Now, we talked earlier about concentration practice and the altered states that can be attained with that kind of practice. And many descriptions of these states could easily be interchangeable with accounts of psychedelic adventures on substances such as LSD, <laughs> psilocybin, <laughs> ayahuasca, DMT, right here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what, what's your opinion on psychedelics? Uh, so uh, there was actually just a, a good thread in the Dharma Overground about this recently. Mm -hmm. um, and I did sort of my summary take on them there, which is that it's all over the place, right? So they're, this, they're a real wild card, and you don't know what you're going to get. So the range is vast from people very validly saying psychedelics opened me up to possibilities and potentials that I never would have believed existed and launched my spiritual life and practice in earnest because I got tastes of amazing things that I then wanted to, you know, duplicate, you know, through my own efforts off the drugs. Mm. And then you have other people who take these things as what can become a real wisdom producing path. Some of the, you know, the deep, you know, um, Amazonian shamans or modern Western shamans or whatever you find that they're able to find real transformation and healing and wisdom through following, you know, ayahuasca paths or in more other, you know, toad or whatever they're doing, mescaline, peyote, et cetera, you know, whatever their preferred substances that, you know, mm -hmm. mushrooms, the various kinds, um, the, and finding real transformation therein. Uh, other people find them, you know, extremely diverting and recreational and just lots of fun, but they don't really gain any obvious wisdom from them. And other people wreck their brains and have horrible trips and years later are still trying to put their fractured psyches back together. And some people end up in jail and plenty of people don't. And some people end up uh, doing bad things on these things and some people handle them just fine and don't have any difficulty and doesn't cause any obvious trouble it's just something they did once it wears off they're fine mm. so you know in terms of what psychedelics do for people it's all over the place and remember mm. of course these things are illegal in the vast majority of countries so mm. um you know uh, be careful and make wise choices that don't end your careers or you know end you up with some horrible criminal record or limit your um options in life um, yeah, I mean, I know someone who back in the heyday in the late sixties was high on LSD with his girlfriend and he wandered away and came back into the room and found his girlfriend in bed with someone having sex with them who was also high on LSD and he killed the guy and ended up <sighs> in jail for 25 years. So, wow. you know, and I know plenty of people who have done hundreds of doses of hallucinogens and had no obvious bad outcomes. So I, I've got, 
you know, so there's this wide range in terms of how the states one can get into relate to spiritual states that might be attained through meditation without the use of drugs. That's a really fascinating, long, complicated conversation that could be the source of a whole podcast. Mm -hmm, But mm -hmm. my summary of that topic is there are clearly some parallels. There clearly is some overlap. The state I would call the arising and passing away, a lot of people manage to cross that and or get into dark night territory on hallucinogens. And I know a number of people who that's why they got into spiritual practice. They crossed Mm -hmm. into real spiritual territory through having, uh, you know, used something. Oh, yeah. Um, Whether it was four (laughs) hits of acid or some mega dose of mushrooms or even a light dose of mushrooms or salvia or whatever it was, or, you know, peyote or ayahuasca or Sonoran desert toad or some synthetic thing or whatever, (laughs) whatever, right? And, you know, I know one person, uh, you know, did a massive dose of mushrooms and was snorting nitrous at the same time, you know, and that seemed to transport them into some really powerful spiritual opening. It happens, right? And then I I know I get calls from people because I talk about the dark side of meditation. Well, that then some of the psychonauts who fried themselves and really hurt themselves contact me and I've gotten to hear plenty of those stories as well. Mm. And, you know, people who years later are still not right and, and um, they did they did real damage and they um, are still having a hard time putting it all back together. And so, uh, and you don't know what's, what you're going to get. That's the mm-hmm. problem with them. You know, mm-hmm. you don't know what's going to happen and sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad, sometimes it's neutral. If, um do I know anybody who I think has gotten real awakening on psychedelics, like real stream entry, real stages, you know, real actual awakening in the traditional sense? No, I don't. I haven't met them in, in any descriptions I actually believe. Do I know a lot of people who have crossed the arising and passing away, which is an important step on psychedelics? Yeah, I, I have a pretty, pretty large number of reports that I believe. Mm, and okay. so that and that got them into interesting territory kind of halfway in halfway out. The problem with the psychedelics is then you didn't do it on your own power and then trying to then you end up being sort of launched into this place where you didn't build all the organic wiring and and the stuff that will get you that that sort of built the foundation so now you may find yourself in territory that you, you weren't really prepared for. Mm-hmm. You you didn't really build it up organically based on, you know, enough time to build all the connections in your brain. Um, that then allow you to do something skillful with that. So uh, it's it's a real, I have real mixed opinions about this. A, num- a reasonable number of the people who taught me initially got into meditation through doing psychedelics. And this is true. Some mm-hmm. of the 60s, you know, Dharma bums and early 70s Dharma bums, <laughs> yeah, they they dropped acid or whatever. And we're like, okay, whoa, there's something more. And then they wanted to draft to India and became great spiritual practitioners when they ordained and spent six years in a monastery or whatever it was, right? And that's mm-hmm. how they got their start. And then, you know, and so it's it's all over the place. Um, yeah, you just don't know what you're going to get. It's sort of the risky way to play the game. Um, mm. Is any of that m- yeah, making that, any sense or seem no, reasonable to you? It seems, seems very reasonable. Um, I mean, there's been a huge study, I'd have to bring it up, but it was a massive sample size, and I believe it was in the States, and it was to do Johns with... Johns Hopkins of psilocybin. Was it this? this no, no, there was, was it that one, or was there was another one where they did it over a few decades, and they didn't find any correlation oh. between mental illness and psychedelic use. I'll, I'll, have, to, I'll have to find it, but um, yeah, I don't know. I, I feel like the, I do feel like the risks that, like the scare tactics used, uh, you know, post sixties and with the criminalization of all the, all the substances are still a little overstated, you know, um, the, the sort of acid, uh, what do they call them? Acid casualty stories and these horror stories. I mean, I, they they definitely exist, but I feel like they're disproportionate in, in what people's actual experience are if they follow the right rules of taking these things and if they take them at, you know, reasonable amounts and not hmm. <laughs> not six tabs of acid, you know, at, at some nightclub in some foreign city with some random people that they've just met, you know what I mean? So it's that's the only thing that, well, you know what I mean? So in junior high school, uh, two friends of mine dropped acid one had a fine experience and the other one came down three months later, was hospitalized for three months until they finally stopped tripping. 
three months. Um, this is this is this is a person I know personally. Okay, well, yeah. and you they came down three months later. So I've seen. So I get to work in an emergency department, yeah, right? Yeah. So we're, that's where the bad end of stuff comes. Absolutely. So like the 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 seventeen year old straight A student I saw who dropped her first hit of acid and three days later was still 100% convinced that she was dreaming. We were all dream people. And she was like, I have to figure out how to sleep. She also hadn't slept in three days. She's like, I have to figure out how to sleep because if I go to sleep, then I will wake up in the real world. <laughs> wow, and okay. there was no, conv- three days, 72 hours later, that's, she's not, I mean, you know, acid lasts, what, 10, 12 hours, yeah, right? right? And so, yeah. So, uh, and then um, I saw another one 48 hours later was having a very similar sense of the thing. Uh, I've seen people hurt themselves. So like when concerts, you know, come to town and you get, you know, it's like some band like Fish or whatever comes by and, <laughs> and, you know, you get, and and yes, sure. Thousands of people probably dropped acid or ecstasy or mushrooms or whatever. And only a few had bad outcomes. Yeah. So it's a small percentage, but it can be real. So I've seen some bad stuff, right? So you get, and that's sort of a skewed sample working in an ER, but I also spent six years on the road with rock bands. Yeah. So I used to be a long haired sound man with, you know, running around these people who considered, you know, dropping mushrooms and ecstasy and smoking a bunch of pot and having a few drinks, normal behavior to go to a show. Mm-hmm. That was just their kind of way of doing things. And I got to see a wide range of positive, negative, and neutral in terms of what happened. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm, yeah, there's the sort of 50s, 60s scare videos. And then there's a seasoned ER doctor who also, you know, has spent, you know, read hundreds of posts about this on the Dharma Overground and spent six years on the road with rock bands, did seven, you know, ran sound at 700 shows and got to see the the real in the field effects of this stuff, good, bad and ugly. And so I, I'm not an unsophisticated um, person discussing this. Does that make sense? Yeah, Absolutely. I guess I guess my my the, I consider that a reasonable basis of experience. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And I guess I've just been uh, the the circle that I've interacted with. They must have been very lucky people. If if as there's been very um, very few of those really bad stories. Yeah, not many, but yeah. yeah so yeah, okay. Yeah, most mostly neutral. So definitely, but, it's definitely a wild card. Yeah, it's a wild yeah, card. Yeah. Don't know. So so people often report on higher. Uh, high doses of some of these things. Contact with sort of entities and gods and spirits and aliens and you know, elf people and all sorts of things. Yeah, and machine elves. Machine elves, as McKenna <laughs> says. And the traditions, are, yeah. the traditions, as, as you say, are clearly packed full of stories of gods and otherworldly beings. So I'm, I'm yeah. curious. And if you get if you get into high end of meditation as well, like that becomes. I'm not sure expected is the right word, but n- certainly normal. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay. So you. Right, and so the the, high, the world of high end meditation, um, you enter, you can enter very fascinating realms that are totally different from this one. Um, just like you can enter it on, you know, ultra powerful psychedelics like DMT yeah. or whatever, and you can have, you know, unbelievably complicated uh, interactions with unbelievably complicated landscapes and unbelievably strange beings that feel as real as this or more real than this hyper real and can be incredibly compelling and causal. And then you have to figure out some skillful way to relate to those things. Yeah. that So both high end meditation and Manda powerful hallucinogens can open up those kinds of uh, dimensions of experience. However you relate to them, that's the whole question. Are we talking conversing in a way with these these beings um in a way that seems like they are an other and something like another person just chatting with another person yeah it doesn't seem like they you at all right they seem hyper intelligent hyper real more real than this yeah more real than ordinary experience a lot of the time yeah a lot of the times those sorts of experiences uh, happen in this sort of hyper real realm in the same realm of sort of ultra lucid dreams mm-hmm. so whereas an ultra lucid dream that you know, particularly if it turns into like a travel, like an out of body travel, can feel more real than most of our waking life. Mm-hmm. And like it's got this this scintillating, unbelievable, like hyper CGI reality to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, in that same kind of way, you can run into that kind of stuff awake in meditation on high dose concentration, just like you can run into it on high dose ayahuasca or you know whatever, mm-hmm. sure, sure, toad or whatever you're doing or mushrooms or whatever. Yeah, sure. So, uh, same and same kind of territory. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 
So what are your thoughts on, on theism generally? Do you think it's possible that these beings sort of, you know, exist outside of us and in, in some sort of other realm? Or are they projections of our belief? Are they, are they contained within our own subconscious? What do you reckon? Yeah, so I'm way more of a pragmatist than an ontologist. Mm -hmm. So I, I care about outcomes more than I care about speculation on what is the sort of ultimate nature of these things. Yeah, sure. And so uh, if one relates to them skillfully and lovingly and well, I think that leads to better outcomes, whether it is that you're relating to one's psyche and relating to your psyche skillfully and loving and well and respectfully, or relating to a being skillfully and lovingly and well and respectfully, or relating to a hallucination, any of those, you have a sort of a karmic choice of how to relate to these things and how you interpret these things, and then how you go about your life after having encountered these experiences. And there are good choices we can make, and there are bad choices we can make, and I've seen both and done both. And um, I think that people have better outcomes functionally, regardless of any sort of speculation about the truth of these things, if they choose the more skillful ways to relate to these experiences and these entities. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally, totally. I mean, and I, I don't mean to dodge the question. I, I can definitely tell you that these experiences often feel more real than most of the other things in your life. Okay, yeah. These tend to experience at peak moments. They have a massive amount of belief, dis uh, sorry, belief suspension. Mm -hmm. They can involve a sense of incredible import and profundity, um, regardless of whether or not one intellectually believes they were just hallucinations or just projections of our subconscious or just the artifact of some drug or some altered state, I will bet that a substantial portion of our subconsciousness, uh, sorry, our subconscious and our emotional body and a lot of other aspects of our brain relate to hyper-real experiences as if they were real. <laughs> yeah, okay. That's fascinating. And wire that way. Yeah. And consequently, I will bet that the way you relate to them impacts your wiring and how you impact the wiring of your brain is causal and relevant regardless of whether or not you intellectually believe they are real beings or hallucinations or something else. <laughs> wow, yeah. Does that make sense? Absolutely. So, well, because you, you mentioned in your book that while some things in this realm would probably not be considered real in the objective sense of the term, it's interesting to talk to them, talk about them in terms of causality. You know, like they may not be predictable, measurable, or real to others, but the cause and effect may have real, real consequences. Like, maybe would you like to expand on that on the the causality thing a little bit more? Because it's really, totally related. Well, actually, I want to really talk to the real to other things. So I have two examples of my own life where I've drawn something in the air uh, and I can see it. And by the way, someone else can too. Oh, okay. <laughs> wow. That's interesting. So, so first off, I would, that those are kinds of experiences and I'm not the only person who's had these kinds of experiences, experiences that really make you question functionally, what is the mechanism by which that occurred? And what does that say about collective consciousness or the nature of awareness or who's dreaming this dream? Is it the god Vishnu? Or, I mean, whatever. Like, you can get onto all these sort of, like, suddenly, it, even a scientific materialist is hard put to try to explain how that happened, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, you're like, what? Yeah. <laughs> and what does it say about the nature of awareness and consciousness and our interaction and and all that stuff. It's, it's, that's complicated. So that's the first thing I want to question, because there are plenty of examples of multiple people seeing the same strange thing, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Being the, the thing of the Virgin Mary or whatever it was in Spain, you know, eight, in 19, whatever it was. I mean, like mass, is that mass hallucination? Is that mass collective visualization of something? Is that mass seeing a real being? Is that, I don't know. I mean, like there are plenty, if you start combing through the literature, multiple people seeing something, you know, because you say, oh, that other people can't see, except it's not always true that other people can't see this stuff. Right, okay. And then what does that say? So that's the first point. Um, uh, but you were saying, regardless of whether or not other people can see it, you had a second question. So uh, so it was uh, just, just that it might not be considered real objectively, 
but you, you, what, you but what does that mean yeah i suppose i suppose if if other people can perceive it as well then that sort of falls to pieces but you 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 said in the book i mean all those things aside. Or even if you say, okay, assume, assuming that, that we, or it's not we could figure perhaps, out what, ob, like. what, ob, what objective meant, yeah. assuming we could figure that out, which the, the more you look at that, the harder that becomes to actually nail down as an operational concept from sort of a scientific point of view. We use that assumption a lot for, and it's a useful assumption, but any definition of reality that's excluding things that are causal I have a problem with because I'm a pragmatist. That's that's and where so, that's where I was going. I w- I'd like you to expand on this causality thing a bit more. All right. Yeah. So so uh, so if you see a being laying on your bed, uh, that's causal, yeah. regardless of how you relate to it. If you see some Garuda or some demon or some angel or whatever laying on your bed, and then it kind of disappears or interacts with you or talks to you. That's a causal thing. That's having effects on your brain, on your causality, on your future behavior, on your behavior at that moment. If e- so any definition of real that doesn't include something causal, that's a pretty weird definition. Sure, sure. See what I'm saying? Yeah, that's that's uh, that's what I found really interesting. So uh yeah. I mean yeah, that's what I was going to get you to expand on, but I think in these last couple of questions we've we've kind of gone around that like uh, around that enough, but yeah, the, yeah, the causality thing is really interesting. I think. Um, yeah, so I'm more of, I, I'm more pragmatist, and so I care about what's causal rather than what's ontologically real, whatever that means. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, in your book, you talk about the nature of reality and this idea that reality is an illusion, which people seem to think is attributed to Buddhism, isn't correct. Um, could you elaborate on that? Yeah, so within Buddhism, particularly kind of within the Tibetan tradition, you will find sometimes they'll sort of talk about the dreamlike or illusory nature of emptiness or empty phenomena. Mm-hmm. And that's usually given in very specific contexts in very specific traditions to achieve very specific practice balancing goals for specific students, you know, overlaid with a whole ton of other philosophy about compassion, you still have to have compassion for the emptiness and all this kind of stuff, to take a teaching that could easily be really misconstrued and um, turn into something skillful rather than dangerous. Mm -hmm. So, um, illusory, so is it true that that a permanent self is an illusion from an experiential point of view? Yes, Mm -hmm. and you can notice that, Mm -hmm. right? So it's not hard to notice all our thoughts vanish, all our bodily sensations vanish. There is no stable anything that we can call a self that is an illusion, albeit a perniciously slippery, sticky, (laughs) habitual, weird one that's hard, kind of hard to shake. Okay, fine. But it's still illusory, and you can relatively rapidly start to at least get a sense of the components of that illusion, even if you don't see totally through it. Mm -hmm. So that's that's not so that's really the most useful uh, um, value or the the most valuable thing about the concept of you know all this being illusion is all this being transient all this being ephemeral the sense of a stable self being an illusion true but is all of this illusion okay there are specific context, specific practice phases, specific traditions, counterbalance with other things that that can be a useful perspective for. But again, they're usually adding in a whole bunch about having compassion for the illusion anyway, Mm -hmm. right? So that you don't just say, oh, it's all illusion, so nothing matters and become all existential or all nihilistic Mm -hmm. or whatever. Go to some of the extremes that they explicitly warn about. If you you were to unpack the rest of these skillful, well-developed traditions that talk about things being an illusion, you will also see the counterbalancing technologies and concepts married to that that help it become not a problem. Mm -hmm. Cool. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, yeah, gotcha, gotcha. Uh, Do you know the blog Qualia Computing? Well, it might be pronounced Qualia. We didn't quite figure out how it's pronounced, but... Yeah, we would generally say Qualia, but you can say Qualia, why not? Um, Yeah, actually, I was just recently introduced to that by a friend and... God, that is some tight philosophy. <laughs> oh yeah, man, yeah. like A plus. That is A plus level philosophy. I, I just go, wow. Okay, that's <laughs> as you know. I read a lot of what I think of as pretty lowbrow bullshit. Yeah, not very well thought out philosophy. No, I, I, I. So I haven't read extensively. I probably, you know, I was 
given one thing that was sort of a summary thing. Yeah. And then I clicked on maybe seven or eight of the little, you know, hyperlinked link terms and concepts and stuff mm -hmm. and read through. So I've made, read maybe eight pages. Sure. I thought it was eight pages of A plus philosophy, yeah. if that makes sense. Yeah, sure, sure. That might have been the Burning Man post, was it? Um, I don't know. It was a sort of, this is my summary of my philosophy. Yeah, he, and, uh, he kind of I did could, that after he, he, he went to Burning Man. And then I think on his reflection and reflections of Burning Man, he kind of summarized the whole lot. But I thought we could... Oh, cool. Yeah, I thought we could get into a little bit of what he's put into some of his posts and I'm just curious where you might sit on, on the on the spectrum here so um so again this is something I just very recently read only read one relatively short post and clicked on maybe seven or eight links no no I, th so I, I think I don't think that'll be consider a problem. myself no sophisticated consumer or, or you know and certainly have not memorized the person's stuff but if you're going to bring up the topics excellent yeah yeah uh, well, we'll have to rely on you I think I think you'll be fine Good. <laughs> uh so he's actually quoted your book in one of his posts as well. I don't know if you know that, but I, no, I, I didn't know. Yeah, I was. It was quite funny just before when I was sussing out some of these questions for this talk. I was on his page and I was looking up what the question I'm about to ask you now, and then I came across some of your words on the page, and I thought, oh, that that looks like a very familiar writing style. Oh, it's Daniel. Okay, <laughs> so that's, that's pretty funny. Anyway, uh, in philosophical terms, he uses Daniel Kolak's vocabulary concerning philosophy of personal identity, which divides the conceptions into three explanation spaces. So the first of these is closed individualism. And this is the view that you start existing when you're born and you stop existing when you die. And alternatively, the soul view of identity in which you are an internal being, yet ontologically separate from other beings. So... We've got, that's closed individualism. There's three of them. Yeah, it's basically existential nihilism as well. Uh, sure. Then we've got, uh, the second of these is empty individualism. And this is the view that we exist merely as a time slice of experience. Who you are is just whatever informational content is present in this very instantaneous moment of experience. So... That's, that's a really good one for that's a good one whose assumptions would be extremely useful for insight practices he, he, so <laughs> as a pragmatist i would adopt that specific framework when doing insight practices because it would be extremely useful he had he actually had a, a list of notable proponents and the buddha was one of them on that one um and the th yes <laughs> yeah and the third of these is open individualism and this is the view that we are all the same universal consciousness in this view, we are all deeply connected. We are all the same eternal being in disguise. So we've got those. Those are the three that he's that he's laid out. And I'm curious where you might sit between those three: close, so, close individualism, empty individualism, and open individualism. Yeah. So closed individualism, I don't find nearly as helpful. The first. So the first one of like you begin at birth and you end at death, and that's just it. Mm -hmm. So I don't find that one helpful from an ethical, moral, uh, high concentration-y, insight -y. I just am not quite sure what its utility is, except perhaps to hold this life a little more lightly and or take it really seriously. I mean, there, there are some skillful ways you can relate to that paradigm, I guess, in terms of hopefully getting some good outcomes from it. Mm. Um, but uh, it's not one I've found as useful as... So the second one from doing insight practice is that we are the information of this immediate moment... That is a really great one if you're going to sit down on the cushion and notice that again and again and again, because that's the kind of stuff that can lead to awakening. Mm -hmm. And then sort of the – and it's interesting that, you know, sort of those three, there are a bunch of other perspectives that I could actually imagine on that, like, you know, but um, – so in terms of the – the third one of being all the the sort of seemingly separate but actually connected consciousness of some massive divinity or some collective consciousness or something, mm. there are plenty of experiences that are hard to explain by any other model than that one, such as collective powers. Mm -hmm. Right. So it is it is tricky to figure out how the collective powers work if you're not positing some kind of model like that. It is tricky to figure out how twin communication or twin empathy 
or fit some of these family empathy things, unless we're kind of radio transmitters, like individually transmitting certain people can pick up our wavelengths or whatever. I guess there are other models you can use. Mm. But um, those are more modern models. And for most of history, they would have used divine models. And there are lots of experiences that that kind of connected integral consciousness model makes a lot of sense for and could have some explanatory or magical value for. And so I can a lot there are a lot of situations where it might be skillful to adopt that paradigm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Is that helpful? Totally, totally. I was I thought that the, those bottom two would be more uh yeah, interesting than the first one to you, but it's it's great to hear you talk about it anyway. Um yeah, I mean he gets into a few other examples and some variations on all three of those uh concepts on in the blog and i think that's actually in the burning man blog i'll I'll link, oh, cool. yeah i'll link it in the in the podcast anyway um where are we now near the end of all the all of these questions i've had for you daniel it's been it's been a trip um where are we it's been a lot of fun it's thank been... you so much for allowing me the opportunity to no no share no no problem at all thank you for coming on this is this has been it's been very, very enjoyable. I've, I'm learning a lot. Um, uh, this is kind of back to the noting thing, just just briefly. Uh, you've you, or you mentioned before, you get up to forty sensations per second. And does this frequency of perception of sensations say more about reality or the processing speed of the brain? So, when you say reality, what do you mean? What are you using as your standard? Uh, your environmental input, I suppose. The thing that contains okay, so, the thing that contains your body, the the environment, I suppose, yeah, the universe. <laughs> yeah, except so, uh, except insight practices have a really different set of assumptions about that. Okay, yeah, sure. As so, you said earlier, yeah. so if you're doing insight practices, you really need to adopt the set of assumptions that insight practice, uh, practices are based on. For that, so it's a framework that makes the practices make more sense and be more efficacious regardless of any question of ontology okay, or right, ultimate right. truth. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, you said that earlier. And so actually. if you're if you're going to go into insight um, practices, assuming that your sensate reality is reality is very important, that the actual sensations you are experiencing or not experiencing are the standard for reality is key. And so as an empiricist would, and by empiricist, I don't mean someone who does empirical experiments. I mean an empiricist in the sense of like Hume, um, the philosopher who would say your experience is reality and using sort of that as the first foundation of reality from which everything else is extrapolated. Um, that as a basis for uh, reality makes a lot of sense from an insight point of view because you not only can realize what is there when it's there you can also realize the vast majority that isn't there a lot of the time, such as most of your body, most of space, most of your visual and auditory field um, are not there. They're just in that moment, only a small portion of what you ordinarily think of as this wide open field of experience is actually there. And then moments later, there's a whole bunch more little inputs, which in this sort of patchwork pointillist, you know, like way, create this sense of something continuous. Just like, have you ever seen these laser shows where they've got like just a few lasers, but they're tracing these patterns really, really fast, right? So they create these elaborate patterns, but it just a few laser beams moving at incredible speed that create the sense of this whole drawing or this whole picture. Have you ever seen a sh- those kinds of shows or seen those kinds of displays? If you could, if your eye had fast enough resolution, it would catch the actual beam um, just as a point moving around, and you wouldn't actually see the whole picture. But you have this sort of, you know, these imprints that kind of last for a fraction of the second on on the retina or whatever, and, and in the brain, and so you can get a coherent picture out of just these little points. But when you get, if you're, if you could crank up your visual speed, you would notice. Oh no, wait! It's just these little points moving around. Well, that's what our whole body and space and mind and everything are. They're like that. And so insight practices don't assume some stable external reality. They assume, no, purely a reality of images and sensations 
and sensate qualities. Mm -hmm. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, sure. So you've got these two modes in, in interacting with your environment and depending on what state you're no, in. No, 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 no. Not interacting with your environment. Well, perceiving your environment. Is, I suppose. <laughs> no, 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 no. So let's, let's talk about the, the scientific model of the brain. Okay. The scientific model of the brain is that somewhere there's a reality. Mm -hmm. There's a bunch of sensations. I mean, sorry, there's a bunch of physical material, real stuff. Mm -hmm. sure. None of which is sensate, none of which is experiencing anything. Mm -hmm. And then somewhere there are these sense organs that in some brain somewhere construct this set of images. Mm -hmm. But all we have access to are the colors, the textures, the smells, none of which correlate with the actual atoms and, you know, fields of, you know, forces or yeah, sure, sure. particles or whatever, because none of those actually have a taste to them. They don't have a smell to them. They don't have a color to them. It's not like the specific frequency or, you know, quantum, you know, energy packet of a photon is actually red or blue or mm -hmm. green. Mm -hmm. Those are all constructs in a brain somewhere. Mm -hmm. But all we have are the constructs. All we have are the images in the holodeck. We don't get to see the holodeck yeah, sure, or its sure. machinery. Yeah. Sorry, I, and I, so, think, I think what I meant was... Um, when you're using, when you're practicing, as you're saying, the other types of, well, the other doing the other types of practice and not insight, uh, the way that you would look at the world and interact with the world is different than when you're doing insight practice. So, yeah. yeah, in insight practice, you assume you're just seeing the holo deck, and you have we'll never have anything but the holo deck. Yeah, that's, and the holo deck is flickering. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. yeah, so it's it's the two yeah. different so, modes of 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 um, yeah of experience. So that's um. Yeah, right, where you don't, in insight practices, you do not assume object permanence. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> Whereas for everything, nearly everything else you do. Yeah, and you, and you probably should, right? <laughs> for yeah. For practical purposes. Sure. Yeah, I find that interesting. You also don't assume solidity, whereas for most other practical purposes, you should assume solidity, <laughs> particularly when like driving, for example. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. So your book mentions profound highs and lows, and... One of the more daunting mm -hmm. lows, which you've mentioned earlier, is the dark night. So I wonder if we could just yeah. briefly, briefly go over the dark night and what the dark <laughs> night is and, 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 and what a dark night yogi is. And yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's jump in. So in, in standard Theravadan map theory, um, so the initial stage is mind and body. You see thoughts are thoughts. Mm -hmm. And then there's the stage of cause and effect. And you see that thoughts... Um, arise from intentions, mental impressions arise after physical sensations, and there's this sort of back and forth interplay of mental and physical sensations in this causal natural way. Then you start seeing the three characteristics of those, you start seeing these arise on their own, this tension, this, these things, you know, arising and vanishing, and and then you can get into a stage called the arising and passing away, which for most people is like the kundalini awakening stage, the raptures, the bells and whistles, the fireworks, the explosions of consciousness, the hypersexual sort of manic phase of spiritual awesomeness. They think they're awakened and it's amazing and they want to practice and they're, you know, but some people find it disconcerting to have all these energetic things going on, whatever. A few people react negatively to it, most people positively. You can have powers, you can have body shudderings and all these weird experiences, right? And the arising and passing way can look like lots of different things. It's a very complicated topic. I could talk for two hours mm -hmm. just on the arising and passing away. So just, it's a, it's complicated. Usually involves energetic stuff, vibrations, hypersensitive perception, and, and it's awesome. Mm -hmm. So that's the high. And then after that comes the low. The next stage is dissolution, which is not that bad. It's like a couch potato we kind of stage where all of a sudden like we're like, okay, what? Okay, what? So it's kind <laughs> yeah. of like you know, if you think of the stoner on the couch, just like sitting there with their munchies, kind of not wanting to go anywhere, like that's sort of the, yeah. you know, that's kind of dissolution is like that. You don't want to hit your alarm clock, you know, you don't want to like, you can't even get your arm to turn off your alarm <laughs> clock in the morning, much less get up. That's what dissolution is like. And then comes fear. And fear tends to involve weird sort of paranoia and terror for no obvious reason. We may find reasons to be afraid. Our mind may fixate on some story or whatever. But the fear is just arising. It's a natural part of the stage. And then we get to misery and disgust and desire for deliverance. Like, ah, I just gotta get out of here. I gotta get out of this life. I've gotta get to a monastery. I've gotta quit my job. I wanna quit my relationship. I wanna, you know, quit my graduate studies. I wanna, you know, whatever. You know, mm -hmm. we just become disgusted with things. We wanna leave and we wanna break out. And then we get to reobservation, which is sort of like a horrible existentially kind 
kind of crisis, sort of people can get really tense and edgy and ah, it's really kind of a horrible thing. And then we break out to equanimity, and then after that, we can get to the stages of awakening if we can figure out how to turn equanimity into awakening. Right, okay. Um, and so, but most people will actually cross the A and P, hit the dark night, fall back. Sometime later, cross the A and P, hit the dark night, fall back, blah, blah. So they go around these cycles, and that's sort of what I call the standard pattern. So these are natural, normal stages of attentional development. However, the degree to which they will manifest as extreme things or gentle things or subtle things or profound things or long things or short things varies tremendously by the person. Okay. So um, some people, these are really minor events, both, you know, they might have an awesome A and P and just minor dark night stuff and get to equanimity and it's no biggie. Like they, they, just, they don't have a whole lot of stuff at that level or they don't, they're not getting stuck or they're, they're have sufficient, you know, maturity or, concentration or, you know, spiritual skills or whatever, just wiring. Who knows? We can come up with all kinds of reasons for what somebody had an easy time, mm. or just like we could imagine all kinds of reasons someone had a hard time. And so some people, their dark nights are really short or really just mild, even if they last a long time. For other people, they're really ass kicking, mm -hmm. right? And, and, you know, everybody say, oh, if it's really ass kicking, it's because you're really spiritually immature, or you were, you know, prone to crazy anyway, or you were already depressed, or you needed meds anyway, you just didn't know it. Well, yeah, it's not always true. So, so I know a lot, you know, I've gotten to meet lots of incredibly smart, diligent, hardworking people who were awesome, you know, PhDs, leaders in their field, uh, you know, doctors, etc., who then suddenly crossed the A and P were suddenly a wreck when they hit the dark night. <laughs> Shit, okay. So, like, it's it's not just oh, it was your fault. Like, sometimes no, like the, the dark night, whatever, for whatever reason, is a real pain in the ass. And so, there's endless debates about like how often this happens and how bad it is, and you know, if, uh, that's a whole nother complicated thing. But it is definitely seems to be relatively well accepted that the harder core practice you practice, the more likely you are to sort of, A, make fast progress, and or B, run into trouble. But that's not always true. Some people, I, I crossed through the dark night when I was a teenager in daily life on very small doses of meditation. And I've met lots of people who have otherwise, and even much younger than I was. Hmm. Um, so I've met people who crossed the A&P when they were like seven years old and kids and stuff. Hmm. Um, that's pretty so intense. It, it happens sometimes, you know, and other people cross it the first time when they're 60. So yeah. it's a huge range. And then how people respond to it and what happens after and how intense the A, or A and P is all vary widely. And so, um, yeah, so, but a chronic dark night yogi, which you asked about, would be a person who's crossed the A and P. They've hit the dark night territory. You know, they're dissatisfied with their life. They've seen suffering in some kind of unusual way they've they've they're half awake to something but kind of half in it and half out of it like they're kind of too into it to go back but they're not far enough along to to finish the thing up and really get all the benefits of yeah. what you know sort of this weird awkward middle place and then they can be like that for years and years and years so i was one of these people for 10 years and i'd sometimes recross the a and p and re kind of refresh my dark night phase but that sort of uh, wanting to get out, having seen something else called outedness, you know, that made me feel like, okay, wait, I'm kind of an alien in this place. Like, what's going on? Like, something's wrong. That kind of was there for a lot of those 10 years. And then when I finally managed to get well trained and learn good techniques that helped me um, figure out how to get to equanimity, which comes after the dark night, and then land stream entry, and then go further into the cycles and learn how to actually call the cycles up and actually call up dark night stages intentionally and figure out how to work with them and what they are and how to relate to them skillfully. You know, there's all these technologies that can help people, um, you know, do this. And I actually consider the sort of arising and passing away to dark night to equanimity to awakening thing just part of normal human attentional development like puberty, like anything else. Mm. Um, and so I think you start seeing the stuff across traditions. And yes, yeah, sometimes techniques can have some sort of mod can sort of modify each of the stages um, in some sort of thematic ways. That said, the basic pattern seems you can find it in all the traditions, mm -hmm. um, from the Christian mystics, the Hindu mystics, to even the descriptions of like philosophers. If you like it, Descartes, you know, mm -hmm. talking about his spiritual experiences. It's, it's, it, it's classically reads, you know, A and P to dark nighty kind of stuff. Tolstoy, I mean, T.S. Eliot, there's lots of them. Mm -hmm. And you, re, you read their spiritual experiences and you're like, oh man, that's it's totally maps very easily and straightforwardly. Yeah, it's, it's quite interesting that it 
sometimes seems to spontaneously arise and just random people that have no knowledge or interest in, in the spiritual part yeah. at all. I read it when I was... Actually, that seems more common. I know way more people who had it manifest, and that's why they got into meditation, rather than people who got into meditation and then had it manifest. Oh, okay. That's interesting. I, I came across a, a few stories when I was looking into Kundalini awakenings, which I found quite interesting. And Yeah, the, that's the A&P. Yeah, that's the A&P, as you say. And uh, this, these these poor bastards that were super straight, super, super square-shaped, and then suddenly have these... A and P events and and all sorts of crazy shit would happen in their life and they didn't know how to deal with it. Yeah, so it sounded really intense right. and horrible for these people. Yeah, but yeah. yeah, it can be really hard. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, very challenging. On the flip sides, on the flip sides of the dark night, you describe some intensely peaceful and blissful states, uh, and you also oh, yeah. say that. We, but you also say that we're still limited by our biology. Is the state of perpetual bliss? That's it's a myth, right? And and how, but how about a state of perpetual and increasingly deep peace, like? Or is that, um, is that equanimity? Is it is that is that more in the equanimity? So side? all mind states are transient. Yeah, that's the first important thing. Mm-hmm. Everything is transient. All thoughts are transient. All bodily sensations are transient. Right. Is it true that through spiritual practice you can become more peaceful? Definitely, and to orders of magnitude beyond what most people would think is true. Is it true that you can become uh, to appreciate in some rapturous? Blissful is kind of the wrong word, but uh, much enhanced way you um, you can appreciate your sensate experience and your emotions. Definitely, you can relate to them in a way that is far more pleasant, let's just say, than the way you related to them before. Far more easy, far more relaxing, far more natural, far more straightforward. Yes, definitely. That said, one is still a mammal. Is pain still pain? Yes. Mm-hmm, yeah. um, can one relate, learn to relate to it in proportional, you know, sort of in proportion to its volume and spatial aspects and temporal aspects in a way that's way less contracted and way more open and accepting and all that? Yeah, definitely. But is pain still pain? Yes. Is, you know, um, are, is biology still biology? Yes. Is it true that by not having all the mental proliferation around certain mind states and by seeing thoughts as these subtle, you know, transient, just aspects of colored, luminous space happening, that we can change the way some of our neurochemistry works and this sort of, you know, envelope. And by envelope, I mean attack, sustain, and release. I'm using musical synthesizer (laughs) terminology here. (laughs) Um, The attack, sustain, and release of our emotions, yes, you can change that. You can change the degree to which you're not triggering bad emotions and to which you're naturally you know, sort of more cultivating good emotions. Yes, all those things, but you're still a mammal, mm-hmm. right? We're still mammals. There's still, there are some limits to how much you can change the way cortisol and epinephrine work, how much you can push this body before it gets hurt, you know, how much, you know, um, you know, influenza seems to level awakened and unawakened people <laughs> alike. Sure. <laughs> uh, Kidney stones still can make awakened people scream. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, right. Uh, so there are some, yeah, I mean, so within, you know, the parameters of birth and death. And, you know, as the Buddha said, we were born. We will feel pain, have conflicts, maybe get old, but certainly get sick and die. Mm-hmm. Um, th- those things are still part of having been born a human. Sure, sure. That's a great answer. Um so we're getting getting pretty close to the end now. Pretty curious on this quite unique intersection that you have between medicine and high level meditation. So, is meditation something you have or would recommend to patients? And are there any interesting anecdotes you'd be willing to share about meditation and medicine? So, yeah, there's meditation and there's high end meditation, and then there's the fact that you never know when someone's going to cross into high end meditation on low dose. <laughs> So okay. it's a funny thing because meditation is, is amazing. So I'm just going to first sort of talk about meditation in general before I talk about it as related to medicine or patients, because I think that's kind of more universally applicable. Okay. M- meditation can do great stuff. It can teach us really skillful metacognitive skill sets and rewire our brains in good ways and help us with cortisol and stress and all that, you know, and help us be more mindful and attentive to our thoughts and relate better to our emotions and you know, be better worker bees or whatever, 
<laughs> whatever we're using our meditation for, you know, it's true. Uh, you know, so you can use it for all these things. And by the way, you never know when you're going to cross the A and P and then be stuck with some real negative, weird side effects. And by the, you know, with Dark Knight stuff, and then have to. At that point, the solution is getting into high-end meditation where you're into the stages of awakening and learning real jhanas. And I mean, so suddenly like that becomes important because otherwise you may be worse off than you were before. Mm -hmm. And I know people who on very, very small doses of meditation got into really complicated, interesting, sometimes amazing, but sometimes really destabilizing territory. And you can check out the work of Willoughby Britton and Jared Lindahl to uh, get a good sense of some of these reports and some of the science and reporting of all this stuff, or just read the Dharma Overground and you'll find thousands and thousands mm -hmm. of posts of people talking about the dark side of meditation and their own challenges related to the cycles of insight. Um, and so do I recommend this to anybody necessarily? Uh, it's a really complicated thing. I mean, so it's a weird thing. Yeah, I've got this whole book. Yeah, meditate. Okay, except it also says, and by the way, meditation can totally screw up your life. Yeah, yeah. Right? So so what's my death count so far of people I know who I am pretty sure have died and or stuff directly related to the cycles of insight? Two, three, uh, I don't know. Wow. It depends on kind of how you count it. Yeah. Yeah, like suicide and other bad outcomes. Yeah. Um, do I know a lot of people have gotten amazing benefits out of meditation? Yeah. So it kind of becomes like the hallucinogen question. Yeah, sure, sure. Right? It's related in some ways, right? Yeah. So you have people are like, oh, everybody should take hallucinogens and it'll expand everybody's consciousness. That's not necessarily <laughs> a good idea for everybody. Yeah. In every context, in every setting, and every person. Do you yeah, see what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Like, it, it, like e even if you yourself might have found some benefit or some insights or some interesting things out of hallucinogens, would you say, oh, every single person should definitely try high-dose hallucinogens? Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, no, right? Yeah, definitely no. Yeah. And I say the same thing about high-end meditation yeah. for, the, for some similar reasons. Yeah. Um, it's kind of like Olympic weightlifting, you know, like some people will become Olympic weightlifters and some people will just blow out the discs in their back and tear <laughs> out muscles and hurt themselves, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, sure, yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, so, and it's, you know, the, high, the higher the dose, the higher the risk. Yeah. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, it's in both camps there. Yeah, I suppose people, as long as people know what they're getting into, I suppose. Right. Well, that's the trick is, is you know, having reasonable disclosure of the risks and benefits. And actually, it's because some, in some ways because of my training as a doctor, we, where we try to talk about the risks and benefits. Say this antibiotic might treat urinary tract infection, but it might give you bad clostridium difficile diarrhea and or cause an allergic reaction. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, it, these things can happen and or hurt your kidneys and or cause weird neurological things or whatever. So we try to tell patients, you know, as best we can, as best that, you know, hopefully understand some of it. Hey, like this is can do good things and can do bad things, which is true of nearly every single thing we do and give. And so I think disclosures of the risks and benefits are useful. And the side effects, like, you know, we put all these side effects all over pill bottles and like, you know, with the package inserts of things, mm -hmm. you know, and that's so we hopefully people can make good choices and have some understanding that there are pros and cons to all of these things that we um, do. And in, in terms of sort of doctoring and meditation, actually in my doctor life, I almost never talk about this stuff. Mm -hmm. So I, I hyper compartmentalize. And um, in my in professional context, almost never mention it. It's like some nurse happens to find my website or whatever and says, hey, meditation, whatever. I'm like, yeah, um, read the book. <laughs> Go practice. <laughs> I don't know. Like, yeah. But okay. I, I almost never talk about this stuff at work. And patients are not really expecting that. That's not what they're coming to an emergency um, medicine doctor for. Yeah. Typically, I need to set their broken bone or you know, you know, diagnose their appendicitis or their heart attack or yeah. <laughs> whatever. Yeah. So uh, yeah. like there isn't a lot of time or a lot of context for the kind of more elaborate conversations that tend to support this better than just saying, hey, go meditate or something. Yeah, you know? sure. I wasn't actually sure uh, exactly what kind of doctor you were. I didn't realize you were in the emergency department. So if I'd known that, I would have, yeah. that would have made a lot more sense that <laughs> you're probably not going to be yarning about jhanas to somebody that's, you know, got appendicitis, as you say. Um, no, maybe yeah. maybe once every year or two, somehow it'll come up in some context or whatever, and I happen to not be ultra busy, yeah. and I'll mention a little something to someone, but it's very unusual. Yeah, yeah, no, that makes sense. 
All right. Well, I thought we could finish up with a couple of fun questions from a party game that I found on your blog as well. This is the game where you would you rather be this or this, or would you rather do this or this? You know. So here we uh-huh. go. Oh, I love that All game. Right. I was just I was actually just playing that two days ago with my step granddaughter. <laughs> Brilliant. All right. So so here we go. So would you rather be able to see in the dark or be able to smell things as well as a dog? Um, so I would definitely take small things as well as a dog. Mm -hmm. Why? Um, because I think the amount that it would open up and the number of circumstances in which it would be useful is vastly larger than the number of situations in which seeing in the dark would be useful. Unless I was, say, a soldier or a thief (laughs) or a spy. If I was a soldier, a thief, or a spy, then I would probably choose see in the dark. But I still might choose smell like a dog. Because uh, or smell as well as a dog, because smell like a dog. No, sorry, smell as well as a dog. Because um, because I think that would open worlds of possibility that we grossly underestimate. Oh yeah, oh yeah, I would agree. How about you? I I would do the same. I think. Yeah. I, I love this idea. There's that uh, that game came out some years back called Dog's Life. I think it was called. I never actually played it, but I I saw a trailer of it or something, and. The idea of this game was that you were a dog and smells were these sort of clouds of color and you'd follow them around. And it's, you know, it's not too far-fetched to, to think that, that there might be the powerful amount of smell that they have. There might be some sort of almost visual equivalency of, of how powerful that is for a dog. So, yeah, sure. it, would be, it would be super, super useful and super interesting to, to have that capability. Seeing in the dark would okay. be cool, but you know we've got goggles that can do that already. <laughs> if we need nice. To. Okay, I've got one for you. All right. So if you could either have retractable fangs, or make your eyes glow red whenever you wanted to, which would you choose, and why? <laughs> that was actually the next one I had on for you. So <laughs> we can swap them around. Oh, nice. Um, actually, I think it was whatever color you wanted, you could make them glow. Okay, yeah, make your glow, eyes glow whatever color you want. Sorry, it's it's fun to make up your own, like, yeah, or, yeah. or whatever. Oh, yeah, well, let's, I, keep I, it, let's keep it at red. Let's keep it at red. Yeah, okay, make your eyes glow red. Yeah. I would probably or choose... Or have retractable things. <laughs> I would probably choose the, the eyes glowing red. And that's because... It would be impressive, wouldn't it? It'd be, more, it'd be impressive and slightly slightly less creepy somehow than retractable fangs. I think if you if you had <laughs> you fang, so? if, if you had just giant fangs just came out of the top of your jaw, you know, and you were trying to emphasize something in conversation, I think people would run a lot more than they would with the red eyes. I'm not sure, but interesting. <laughs> yeah. I think both would are likely to produce some pretty strong reactions. Oh, oh, absolutely. But I think maybe the huh. red eyes is it slightly less threatening than huge fangs that might suggest that you're going to suck their blood or something. What about, yeah. <laughs> what, about what about you? Um, so I think I would actually take a uh, glow in the dark eyes only because I've fantasized since I was a child about being able to do that. I'm not quite sure why. Okay. Right. Okay. Fair enough. All right. Next one is, uh, and I've got one of my own that I've thrown in here at some point. So, oh, good. yeah. So the next one is from you, from your blog is, uh, would you rather be totally impervious to cold or totally impervious to heat? Uh, definitely totally impervious to cold. I hate the cold. And so I would take cold over heat. Although I can see a reasonable number of uses for heat, mm-hmm. actually, like cooking and stuff. If I was in a professional kitchen all the time, I'm sure I would take heat. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. You? Uh, I'm the same, actually. I go to the sauna regularly, and a friend of mine and I are, are building a sauna at the moment. That's how much, nice. that's how much the, the heat's good. I actually quite enjoy states of you know 90 degrees Celsius, really, really hot, sweating it out for half an hour. I really love it. So the cold awesome being able to jump into into ice cold water and 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 hang out outside and the and the freezing winters and walk through snow and that that would be that would be for me more useful than the than the heat one i actually am thinking of going and studying with vim hoff actually because i <laughs> yes. hate the cold so much i thought i should just do it and see if it's the thing that everybody seems to say it is oh uh, i i'm pretty convinced that it is uh, have you tried? Yeah. Have you tried any of his his breathing techniques or any of his methods? I haven't yet, but I need to. That's quite. They're quite useful. I uh, I got a bunch of my friends. I learned the method, the, for the breathing technique, and I've got a bunch of friends doing it. We actually do it in the sauna sometimes, and then we go out and cool. your whole body sort of vibrating and and sort of starts to seize up with all this. I don't know saturation of oxygen, I suppose. And then you can jump when you jump into cold water, like a cold shower or a cold plunge. You don't actually feel the cold. It's quite crazy. It's like... Amazing. Yeah. That's really cool. 
All right. Um, next one is uh, this is one that I've I've come up with. So, would you rather take a ship into orbit, spaceship obviously, and see Earth from space, weightless, or take a personal submarine to the bottom of the Mariana Trench? Oh, definitely space. Yep. Why is that? Because uh, I actually have a lot of dreams where I actually fly up. Um, I have a lot of flying dreams, and some of them involve flying up over the planet, and so. I've been dreaming for a long time of what it would be like. And I think at the bottom of the Mariana Trench would be really, really interesting to have been there. But unless you had a ton of light, it's probably just going to look very dark. Mm -hmm. And you're not going to be able to see very far. And so I think in terms of just a view and visual experience, it'd be way more interesting to be weightless than the bottom of the Mariana uh, the Trench, even though that would be really cool. Yeah, yeah. You? I'm the same, actually, yeah. which is quite funny. Nice. It's like a dream. And I think it's actually, you know, within the next 30, 40 years, it's possible that there'll be some sort of a commercial thing that you can get into orbit and look down at space for quite a sum of money. I'm, I'm, I'm really... I think, uh, I think that's happening. Is that not happening now? Or close to almost? Richard Branson's doing, he's trying to do something, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah, that's what I mean. And I think within... A reasonable amount of time that will be within financial reach, and I think, you know, even if that's the, the worth a deposit on a house, that would that kind of experience would be would be totally worth it. Yeah, it's a hundred thousand dollars at the moment, or something. Am I making this up? Virgin Galactic or whatever? What does it cost? I don't know. It might be a hundred grand. I'm not sure. I, I'm thinking. I'm hoping yeah. that within you know like twenty years or something, it'll be down to like twenty or ten grand or something. Who knows? Sure. Yeah. Be good. That'd be great. Cool. <laughs> yeah. All right. Last one. Would you rather have large functional bat wings or large functional angel wings? Uh, definitely bat wings. <laughs> Why, is that? Why is that? Um, so I, th- I just think the bat wings would be way more suited to my personality and style <laughs> of flitting and uh, flying around. I've, I think I'm way more of a flitter than a sort of a majestic glider. Not that majestic gliding couldn't be cool. And I think they would convey more of a sense of my personality. So again, talking woo and woo, um, I've had some past life experiences mm-hmm. and in one of them I was a bat. <laughs> or a bat-like thing of some kind. Cool. <laughs> and uh, I really identify well with bats and have always thought, God, bats are so neat. And so how about you? Uh, I would lean towards the bat wings as well. I think if you just busted out angel wings, it would be pretty pretentious and like, you know, it'd say a lot about, the, you know, look at me, you know, <laughs> look how holy sure. I am. I don't know. But, right. But in the, at the same in the same moment, it might be, people might, you know, it might be less creepy again if you had angel wings yes. rather than than bat wings i'm really i'm really definitely true if they're both as functional yeah. as as each other and if i if i could get either i, I would take either <laughs> to be honest that makes sense yeah absolutely yeah good cool nice. man all good right choice. well let's that was uh, fun that was really fun so how can people find you and your work um just plug maybe just plug all your websites books and and etc again just so people can can if they want to read more and delve a bit deeper they can yeah, so actually I would refer people to the Dharma Overground, www.dharmaoverground.org, which you can find a fascinating community of people who are into high-end meditation in all kinds of different ways from all kinds of tra- different, different traditions, helping each other in a relatively egalitarian style to just go deep and practice well and, and process things and figure out what it all means and what we can do and explore the functionality of our brains and and all that. So that's the first thing I would recommend because I think this works better as a group project than, you know, individual sort of teacher student D or whatever hierarchy or whatever. So I think it's it's fun with friends. Mm-hmm. Um, so but you can if you want my individual stuff, you can find it at www.integrateddaniel dot info or www.interactivebooter.com. That was a website name that was given to me a very long time ago by some friends. They both lead to the same place. And there's all kinds of uh, stuff there. You can also check out www.firecasina, F-I-R-E-K-A-S-I-N-A dot org. And you can find a bunch of free stuff and cool uh, free book. And um, also on my website, you can find my book. You can find a copy of it for free. And by the way, um, Mastering the Core Teachings of the Buddha will be coming out in a second edition, hopefully in April. And there will be a free online version, of course, because I go out of my way to not make money on the Dharma if I can possibly 
we help it. And um, and yeah, so there you go. That's that's all my plugs for various places. And on Twitter, if you want to follow my totally political side, which mostly is not particularly dharmic, but just mostly highly sort of leftist, socialist, <laughs> etc., you can find me at Daniel M. Ingram, all one word. Great. Daniel, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. And I also want to say thank you for making these resources available for free online. That book, your book has been really, really interesting, enlightening and clear and refreshing and... Also, this chat was was incredible. It cleared up a lot of things for me, and I just found, as I say, refreshing. It's, it's there's no bullshit, which I which I really like, and it's very hard to find. Uh, I mean, there's still my opinions, right? So realize this is all filtered through the conditioning of one, you know, limited mammal, right? Oh, so of just keeping that in mind. But it's so kind of you to say those things. It was really nice of you. Thank you so much. I actually, have your inque- your questions have all been very intelligent and insightful, and already contain a lot of the answers within them. There were just good platforms for riffing on those. So thank you for all that. <laughs> it's been problem. lots of fun. Not a problem at all. And uh, yeah, so if I ever uh, find myself down your way, uh, I should look you up. And if you, for some strange reason, you find yourself in Northern Alabama, come on by. Absolutely. Yeah, you'd be very, very welcome. All right. right, Wonderful. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. See ya.